insider tips and the latest consumer news, from warnings about knockoff weight loss drugs to what you should consider before buying pet insurance. It's all coming your way. But first, I'll look at new technology that aims to make school buses safer for students. This is video from a school bus in North Carolina. Watch as the students on the left attempt to cross the road to board the bus, but then are nearly run over. And this Ohio bus driver hailed as a hero after saving a student from being hit by that car. These incidents are known as stop arm violations. A new survey estimates this happens more than 43 million times every year. These stop arm violations can have deadly consequences. According to a government report, 13 year old Evelyn Gurney was run over and killed by a driver in Wisconsin as she prepared to board her bus. The report stated the stop arm was deployed when the driver swerved around it and struck her. But new technology aims to make it safer for students by enabling buses to communicate directly with cars. I'm here in Indiana at the test track for IC Bus. It's the nation's largest bus manufacturer, and I'm going to show you for the first time how it all works. It's called Cellular Vehicle to Everything, or CV2X for short, and it's being developed by dozens of automakers and tech companies, including Audi and IC Bus. It just takes safety to the next level. With me is Justina Morrison from IC Bus. The bus driver slows down and extends the stop sign. Heading toward us is a car also outfitted with CV2X technology. That screen alerts the bus driver of the approaching vehicle. Near my vehicle in motion. As the car gets closer, the technology senses it has not slowed down, once again warning the bus driver, don't let kids off that bus. High speed vehicle approaching. What is that screen telling the bus driver right now? It's telling the bus driver how fast the car is approaching, how close the car is to the school bus, as well as from what direction that car is approaching the bus. So we saw how this tech works on buses, but what about for drivers of other cars who really need to know where those kids are? With me is Palm Mohotra from Audi to talk about what the experience is like behind the wheel. Palm, how will this prevent crashes? So the technology that we have in the Audi e-tron actually communicates directly with the school bus up to 10 times a second. And it doesn't matter if the driver in the vehicle is actually able to see the other vehicle hmm. or not because it can look around corners, it can sense a vehicle through an obstruction like another vehicle. And this is how we prevent accidents on the road and save lives. Let's see how it works. This time the bus is stopped, but I can't see it because it's hidden from view by that semi-truck. As I approach, I get a warning on my dashboard. Wow, so Palm, I don't even see a bus or any stop signs, but already the car is telling me something's ahead. Exactly, and it's telling you, heads up, you need to slow down. Okay, let's see what happens when I don't slow down. And there's the warning. It gives me an extra time to react, and that can be the difference between life and death. Absolutely. We try it again, now with the semi-truck behind the bus as I maneuver to pass it. This is a very real scenario. A big rig slowed down in front of me, I don't see anything, so I'm just gonna change lanes around it, but there's the school bus. Now I'm getting the stop indication. And if I don't stop, there's that alert. And I had plenty of time to stop. And CV2X isn't limited to buses and cars. It can be used to alert drivers to approaching emergency vehicles, upcoming construction zones, bicycles, even pedestrians, as long as they're equipped with the cellular technology. But the safety benefit that it delivers on the road is incredible. Incredible safety when everything on the road can communicate so we can avoid scenes like this. The technology is not exclusive to Audi or Navistar. Nearly every automaker is working to get this into their vehicles as quickly as possible. Audi says they're hoping it will be standard technology in their vehicles within three to five years. Now, if you think that's a long time, the FCC actually set aside the bandwidth to make this all possible all the way back in 1999. Next, drugs like Ozempic are being used for weight loss, and recently, more websites have been selling knockoff versions. But are they safe? These days, it seems like everyone is looking to shed a few pounds. Baby, the hype is real. But as the craze for using diabetes drugs for weight loss grows, so too is the emerging market to get so-called knockoff versions of these popular medications, all without a prescription. A new report by the Wall Street Journal found more than 50 websites selling semaglutide and terzepatide, the active ingredients in diabetes drugs like Ozempic and Manjaro. Anytime demand vastly outstrips supply, entrepreneurs will step into the breach. 
While nearly all of the websites have disclaimers that the ingredients are not for human consumption, the journal found some had instructions for how people could use the substances on their own. They're not verifying who you are, and they do things like prefer to be paid in Bitcoin. The paper also says at least 18 of the sites have run ads on Instagram and Facebook in recent months, including ones like these from SAF Research, offering huge gains and a buy one, get two free deal on their vials of semaglutide. Facebook and Instagram's parent company Meta says they've removed ads for the sites on their platforms after being flagged by the journal, telling NBC News in a statement reading in part, our policies prohibit the advertisement of prescription drugs without the proper authorization and approval. On its website, SAF Research offers numerous disclaimers stressing their products are not dietary supplements, but instead research chemicals for laboratory use only. But some are choosing to ignore these kinds of warnings. Across the websites they reviewed, the journal found that a month's supply of the ingredients cost around $100 to $200, compared to brand name drugs like Ozempic, which can cost around $1,000 a month without insurance. Lori Sicatello says she was prescribed Ozempic for her type 2 diabetes last year. Months later, she hit an insurance coverage gap, making it too expensive for her. They said now it's going to be $754. So she began taking research-grade semaglutide that her friend found online for about $100 a month. What's really in this? What am I, what am I taking here? By the end of the month, I wasn't comfortable with taking it anymore. The FDA is now sounding the alarm about the potential dangers of buying these ingredients online, saying in a statement that they advise consumers to not purchase peptides marketed as sold for research use and mix, ingest, or inject them. There are no FDA-approved generic versions of these substances, and drug makers Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly say they don't supply their ingredients to companies selling research substances. Earlier this year, our NBC News investigation found more than a dozen telehealth websites advertising Ozempic for weight loss. I experienced firsthand just how easy it was to get these medications online at a low cost. Admit my request. I had my Ozempic prescription by the very next day. My producer also got a prescription. This is Jamie. No one ever saw us on video or in person, and neither of us has diabetes or would be medically defined as obese. While it may seem like it's becoming easier than ever to get your hands on these drugs, experts say doing so comes at your own risk. I really advise patients to steer clear of the online versions because we just can't control the quality or the safety in those cases. The Wall Street Journal tells us some of the websites they contacted have already been taken down. We reached out to SAF Research for additional comment. We have not heard back. The website says they use different marketing tools to reach their audience and that none of their ads make claims that could send the wrong message about their products. SAF also emphasizes they do not sell supplements or medications. With so many counterfeit options, Novo Nordisk actually launched a website, semaglutide.com, to help people spot the difference between what's real and what's fake. Coming up, is pet insurance really worth it? How to decide if it's right for you. Plus, tips to help college students eat healthier on a budget.
Welcome back, Americans. We love our pets, and more owners are now getting pet insurance. But it can be confusing to figure out if it makes sense for you. We help break it down. We love our pets like family. An estimated 111 million American households have a dog or cat. And just like any member of the family, health care is important, but an emergency vet visit can cost between $250 to $1,600. It's prompted a booming business in the U.S., pet insurance. The number of policies purchased at the end of last year has risen nearly 93% since 2019. It's another kid. You know, I have three daughters and I have Lucy. You got her as a puppy and immediately you thought, this is a good idea to have insurance for our pet. Why? Well, just like you would insure your children. You want to make sure, you know, if something bad happens that they're protected. Jeff Foose purchased a policy from True Panion, among the nation's largest pet insurance companies. He says his coverage started at $33 a month for Lucy. But after nine years, the cost has risen to almost $80 a month. That's a 141% increase. Foose says in some years, his rate increased more than the 20% his policy said it would never exceed annually. Do you think this was a worthwhile investment? Absolutely not. It can be hard to tell if pet insurance is worth it for you. We requested quotes from five popular companies using Bruno, a three-year-old mixed breed dog. For similar coverage and a deductible between two to $500, take a look at the rates. Embrace at the low end at $41 a month, Trupanion the highest at $167. None covers routine exams. We would absolutely recommend that you get your insurance when you have a puppy or kitten because that's when a pet doesn't have any pre-existing conditions. Margie Tooth is the president of Trupanion. The company brought in almost a billion dollars in revenue last year and says it's paid two billion in claims since the company was founded in 2000. We asked her about Jeff Foose's case and other complaints that Trupanion has raised its premiums to unaffordable levels that are far higher than vet care inflation. You said it's important to your company not to make consumers feel like it's a bait and switch, and yet we have talked to some who feel like they're not getting what they were promised. How do you respond to those criticisms? It's very disappointing to hear that people feel that way. I think we, we work very hard to ensure that we're explaining our value proposition and that we make it clear to people when they sign up with us that your price may change. Do you think there's enough regulation to make this industry uh, transparent and to help consumers really understand the pricing models? I do not. I think it's changing. I think it needs to continue to change more. It's a bad financial product. Kevin Brassler is executive editor for Consumers Checkbook, a nonprofit providing price research and consumer advice. In the case of pet insurance, we found that overall, compared to the payouts and the premiums you have to pay and all the other out-of-pocket expenses, they're generally really bad deals for most pet owners. Do you think it's a better idea to set aside some money in a rainy day fund rather than paying these premiums? Yeah, I mean, you're going to do far better off financially in the long run by taking those premiums that you'd pay to pet insurance companies and just saving them and taking care of your pet's costs out of pocket. If you want to buy pet insurance, Brassler says check accident-only policies to cover emergencies like car accidents or poisoning and look for a higher deductible plan to lower your monthly payments. Foose says he would have been better off with a rainy day fund. If you had just paid out of pocket for Lucy's incidents, mm -hmm. would you be ahead? I'd be ahead of about $2,300, $2,400. We reached out to Embrace. They told us their policies provide peace of mind and like insurance for homes, cars, and people, pets should be protected too. Up next, healthy and budget-friendly meal ideas for college students. And later, a look at what's fueling the growth in popularity of stick shifts. Consumer Confidential continues after this break.
Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. College students, they're not making the grade when it comes to healthy eating. So I hit the grocery aisles with a chef who specializes in healthy and budget-friendly meals. With nearly 3 million freshmen expected to attend college this fall, many students will live on their own for the very first time. A fresh taste of freedom served with a full plate of new responsibilities. Gail Cresci, a registered dietitian at Cleveland Clinic Children's, says as first-year students adapt to college life, some may struggle to maintain a healthy diet, a time I remember all too well. It was a lot of pizza, it was a lot of cookies, it was a lot of eating late at night, and a lot of contributing factors to the so-called freshman 15. Where are some areas that calories like to hide and sneak into a first-year student's diet? We find hidden calories in things like alcohol. Another area is with coffee. You may get some of those extra syrup flavorings, a whipped cream that's on those coffees. We see a lot of extra calories with fast food. What are three things you might advise a first year student when it comes to eating healthy? Avoid eating late at night if at all possible. And you're going to be hungry during the day, so have some healthy snacks available that are quick grab and go. Another thing is to make sure you're drinking adequate water. Crashy also recommends eating 20 to 30 grams of protein at each meal, which equals about three ounces of chicken breast or lean beef. This is where you live okay. when you're in college. We've called on chef, TV personality, and senior food editor for Budget Bites, Monte Carlo. Monty, class is in session. Yes. Clearly we got the assignment. You're Kale University. Okay, School of Hard Knocks. Yes, I'm representing University of San Francisco. So you say that when kids are off on their own for the first time, mm -hmm. often cooking on a budget, you gotta start with an A-plus grocery list. You have to start with an A-plus grocery list. And the best part is it's a really cheesy, easy one. Let's go. Let's start with fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. It's important to eat nutritiously, yes. but this stuff is expensive and it doesn't always last a long time. No, it doesn't. This has the life of like a Disney star, what, like 24 hours? But the best deal for you when you want berries in your life is to go frozen. These fresh blueberries cost about five bucks a pound, but for the same price, you can buy three times that amount frozen, adding them to oatmeal, yogurt, or smoothies. Let's talk about packaged produce. Yes. What's your tip here? Do not do it. It's a no-no? No, come on, you're gonna pay like five dollars for poor little pizzas of corn when you could buy this for 59 cents a pop, right? Ah. Just peel it, bro. It's not that hard. And right. if you have a microwave, you have fabulous fresh corn. Carlo, who teaches college cooking classes, says when it comes to appliances, every dorm room or apartment also needs a coffee pot. You can use it to make soups. You can use it to make eggs. Anything that you would stew or heat up in a pot, you can make in a coffee pot. <laughs> The next part of our lesson, a study of hot deals on frozen meals. A staple of college life is pizza. pizza. But you don't want to be dialing that pizza delivery company. No. One pepperoni pizza is $17. You can get three for $10. Carlos suggests stocking up on a variety of store brand frozen vegetables to use as pizza toppings. It's starting to feel kind of gourmet. Okay. Or as a way to help another college classic earn some extra credit. Are you ready for the pop quiz? I guess so. Which country consumes the most ramen per person per year? USA? No! Vietnam! Yeah! We love our ramen. Costing three bucks for six servings, Carlo partially cooks the noodles and divides them into mason jars with the veggies. When you're ready to eat, you add a little water, a little broth, you put it in the microwave, and you're set. So you just pre-make these ramen jars? Yes using your noodle to find a cart full of savings. Winning. Class dismissed. Ah! For other budget-friendly tips, consider shopping store brands and downloading the store's app for extra savings. Also, shop the less popular cuts of meat like chicken thighs or sirloin tip steaks and add beans to meat dishes for more bulk and protein. Now let's switch gears to the recent growth in popularity of stick shifts. I hadn't driven a stick in nearly 20 years, so we found the best instructor to rev up my skills, a NASCAR champion. Drift, slide, side to side. But before we get into my skills behind the wheel, let's revisit that time in 2019. When Dylan and Al taught Craig and Chanel how to drive with a manual transmission. I didn't even feel you change it. Because I'm that good. As for me in 2023, you decide. Let's take it for a spin. Right, 
All right, so that's not exactly how it went, but I was in for some fun. Today we're outside City Field here in Queens, New York, and this this is the brand new Mustang Dark Horse. It is a manual transmission car. I can't wait to take it for a spin. Problem is, the last time I drove a stick was 15 years ago. But lucky for me, look who we have here, NASCAR Hi. driver, Coca-Cola 600 champion, Ryan Blaney. Hi, thank you so much you? for being here. Yeah. So there is a rise in interest in these manual transmission cars. What's the appeal, Ryan? I feel like the appeal of manuals is it kind of makes the driver feel one with the car. You're engaged. It, yeah, that's a great word. It makes you very engaged with the car. So I'm really excited to show you around it. Okay, so you'll stay with me as I kind of like go oh, yeah. through the bumps? I got you. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right. I'm the first TV journalist to drive the dark horse. I know, tough assignment. What is the first thing I should be thinking about? So first thing is, left foot in on the clutch. Okay. As you're letting your left foot off the clutch, and you know, your right foot's going down to the gas, and it's like at an even motion. So a lot of people kind of dump the clutch, and that's when you get like the big herky jerky. Did you bring a bar bag? Yeah. There we go, all right, all right. You know, it's like riding the bike. I'm picking it back up again. Yeah. And you know what? This, I have to pay attention when I'm driving a stick. There's no time for texting and being on the phone. Your right hand's working, your left hand's on the steering wheel. You're not gonna be on your phone, right? While stick shifts accounted for 1.3% of sales in the U.S. in June, searches for new manual cars are up 13%. It's a bright spot in an otherwise downward trend. In 2000, more than 15% of new and used cars sold by CarMax were manual. By 2020, it was only 2.4%. Compare that to electric vehicles, which now make up 5% of car sales. Let's switch gears and have you show me how it's really done. Okay, yeah? let's do it. <laughs> but before we do, Ryan revs up the settings on the car. Ooh, you put it on some sort of race flag mode. We're gonna have some fun. I'm excited. You can't do worse than I did. I actually went off the track. Woo! Yeah, here we go. So what mode are we in right now? Woo! Super fun mode? Yeah, super fun mode. <laughs> what do I smell? Is that rubber? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like real life Fast and Furious, Ryan. Yeah, I don't recommend anyone doing that on Definitely. the roads. But we were here, we were safe, and I'm happy you had fun. Ford's manual transmission Bronco is also seeing a spike in interest. There's a lot more people ordering them, and you can definitely tell that they're getting becoming more popular. Autumn Schwalbe is a future product planner for Ford's performance cars. She says aside from the fun of driving a stick, manuals can be cheaper too. On average, stick shifts cost nearly $1,800 less than automatics. What are your friends saying about manual transmission? I do know a lot of people that are super willing to learn at my age. As for me, I finished in victory lane. I didn't have to do much teaching, so I was, I'm just happy I just get to sit here and ride. Best journalist driver of the day? By far. <laughs> Your check will be in the mail later. <laughs> Up next, a mom creating diverse and inclusive dolls for everyone. the heels of Barbie mania, there's renewed interest in dolls. And I recently met a mom on a mission to make playtime more inclusive. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. 
Barbie's blockbuster summer brought dolls back into the spotlight. And a look at what's for sale now reveals a slew of new toys, from dolls for boys and female action figures to Miniland's dolls representing children with Down syndrome. And Mattel's fashionista line, featuring a doll in a wheelchair. Even Lego spreading love to the LGBTQIA community with this Everyone is Awesome set. In a $40 billion industry, 50% of parents rank diversity and representation as a top consideration when toy shopping. I was just shocked by the fact that I couldn't find a single doll that I thought looked remotely like any Asian child I know. Eleanor Mack says last year, while shopping for a doll resembling her now three-year-old daughter, Jillian, she was disappointed. You only knew those dolls were Asian because they had a name like Ling, or they were holding a panda bear, or they had that really bad blunt haircut. American Girl produced Corinne Tan, a Chinese-American doll, in 2022, in part to help kids deal with anti-Asian racism. But Max says the doll's backstory highlights the Chinese father's lack of work during the pandemic. Her Chinese-American father is this struggling ski instructor in Aspen who effectively can't provide for the family. The mom gets a divorce, remarries a wealthy white guy named Arnie. Wow, I did not know the backstory of that doll. Your reaction is exactly how I felt. And it wasn't just the backstory. And when I looked at that doll, the big round eyes, the skin color, she just didn't look Asian. American Girl telling NBC News the Corinne backstory was written by an Asian American author and designers consulted with her and an anti-Asian racism expert, among others, on Corinne's hairstyle and color, skin tone, and a new eye sculpt to more authentically reflect her Chinese American heritage. The company adding the doll has received an overwhelmingly positive response from fans. I wanted our children to be proud of their Asian eyes, to know that they are beautiful. Mac decided to make the doll she wishes she had as a girl, working with other Asian American parents to design, develop, and source the materials. Just a year after coming up with the idea for an Asian American doll who loves to bake with her grandmother, Mac introduced the world to Jilly Bing. What was your daughter's reaction when she saw this doll for the first time? She just gasped and she's like, Jilly, she looks like me. You want to color in Jilly Bing? Mac eventually left her job in healthcare. Now her San Francisco home is Jilly Bing headquarters. How many dolls in this house right now? Three or 400. Um, we start out with close to 2,000. So she has a little chef's hat that flips over and becomes this little who doesn't love an egg tart. Exactly. Jilly Bing becoming part of a trend of non-white dolls originating in the 1960s. We're seeing games, we're seeing puzzles. And it's really starting to broaden the horizon so that kids can go into a store and they're gonna see toys that really reflect the real world that we all live in. James Zahn, senior editor at the Toy Insider, says consumer spending has convinced toy makers to invest the time and money it takes to develop more inclusive products. When kids are able to play with toys that look like themselves or look like their family, their friends, whoever they're seeing in the community, I think that it just sort of works with their own development in thinking of the world as a very diverse place. And when those toys step beyond stereotypes, they can have a lasting impact for generations. And that's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Vicki Wynn. When most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now there are dozens of Coneys in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit style Coney in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal 
has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Ow. Hi, good to see you again. Good to see you. Long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner, has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're gonna go into the hot dog business, but we're gonna top it with something Greek now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kiros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history, from national to Kirby's to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island to L. George's to Leo's and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. We that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a Coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people so good, a little upset with us. I'm like, dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? 
it was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. We're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa, remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili's a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. Okay. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments, people, about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soteropoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learn how to make the quintessential cone. One up! Right there, nice shot. Yeah. At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vi vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of Coney's. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing, yes, it's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lamb skin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Get. Pork, beef, and a and That's lamb. That's right. 
And that's what makes it pop. Like when you bite into it, oh, it snaps snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun. It's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. That's they, what we were talking. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's steamer. just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little. Grab your plate. Yes. All right, so we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to... I want to watch the top. Okay, give it a little mix. Little, this is that... Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime. Nothing, nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom, okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. magic. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means one. I need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it, chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, Al. A little All right, more. That's not too bad. OK. <laughs> Boom. All right, now keep, I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. you want the it. chili to go Yeah, in. you want the chili. You want it, yeah. I want that chili. Don't chintz out on that chili. Don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier for uh, you to pour over there. All right. There. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right. Exactly. And mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. They are a nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer Bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. 
In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal, they're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid-80s. This summer, we're gonna be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotine, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced, you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family and family employees, that's what John is. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. It's really nice being run by a family on business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits and we learn from each other and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney's, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and the grandparents, family time. Coney dogs go, that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of 
product that we're sending out each day from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night. I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth. Just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, or my kids' kids, have them look back, at family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool county spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan coney spot in the coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were gonna open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, ah, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. 
So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior to reflect like my basement or my living room where you can come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with his food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tastes so similar to it would as a, a regular Pony Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you're know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? This is chili? beyond uh, crumble, uh -huh. a plain beyond crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us, but it's been tough, yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying, we're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay. Hi guys, welcome to The Boost. To kick off our show today, we will introduce you to a few intrepid women pioneering across the sea and sky. In November 2024, the Artemis II rocket will take a trip around the moon. We got an inside look at this historic mission from a NASA astronaut who's made history in her own right. Christina Cook is used to being the only woman in the room, and come next year, she'll be the only woman who's headed to the moon when she embarks on the Artemis II mission planned for November 2024. But that first is just the latest on a long list, going back to when she was named an astronaut a decade ago. A phone call 
she remembers well. And I actually started out by telling them, hey, it's okay, I had a great time interviewing. Thanks for considering me. And they actually had to interrupt me and say, actually, we're calling to tell you we want you to join our team to come to Houston. Since that day, she set records, like the longest single space flight by a woman with a total of 328 days in space and participating in the first all-female spacewalk. What was that moment like, going out with all women? Yeah, it was, it was incredible. Hopefully that got people thinking about where we're at. We weren't just out there for a participation ribbon. We, we wanted to actually be excellent spacewalkers. This isn't very well known, but the coolest thing about that spacewalk was it was unplanned. It was the only spacewalk I did that was not planned prior. I never trained for it, she never trained for it. We actually went out to fix something that had broken. So we designed the entire spacewalk in one week with the teams on the ground, and normally a spacewalk is developed for years. Along the way, she's faced obstacles unique to women in the male-dominated field. The fleet of suits is actually built for a bigger-bodied astronaut. So I go out and do spacewalks in a suit that's two sizes too big for me. There actually are time factors that they add in for how much longer tasks will take in someone who's doing a spacewalk in a suit that's too big for them. Are there things about your job that you think are changing and will change and will continue to get better as more women do this? Definitely. In fact, the suit is a perfect example because the next suits that they're making for the moon surface operations are actually going to, by design, fit a very wide range of people. Among your many accomplishments, adding another one, the first woman on a lunar mission. What was it like to get that news? It was great news. Funny story, we were actually all late. No one was on time to this meeting. We had a meeting put on our calendars under a different pretense, so none of us had any idea how important this meeting was going to be. We were asked, how would you like to fly on Artemis II? Uh, when, you know, after walking in and seeing the people in the room, I knew that it wasn't a meeting I should have been late to. <laughs> but um, after kind of regaining my composure, you know, it took me a second to take it in. I said it would be an honor. and and we'll try not to disappoint you in the future by being late. <laughs> they'll be on time and they'll be uber prepared. Cook will be a mission specialist on the 10-day Artemis II mission that will send four astronauts around the moon on the Orion spacecraft. The team is currently training on a simulator Cook is seeing for the first time with us. This is our sim and it's just getting ramped up. And this is the first time the seats have been installed and we have software up and the displays are, are on. When we're on that far side of the moon is when we will probably be executing something like this. There we go. Oh, so there, oh, why the moon? Yep, yeah, the moon is there. This is the dream come true of any astronaut. It's still exciting every single day that we get to come and do training in this mock-up. The crew is taking courses in this exact replica of Orion. This is my seat, oh, so you're no. going to be sitting in my seat. Okay, that's, that's great. I claim that this spot up here, that's going to be my sleep spot. We'll be laying on our backs, facing okay. up, and when we start to actually accelerate, we'll have that feeling of acceleration like this way, like kind of being pushed back in your chair. When you think about that moment, nerves? Are you scared? Are you excited? What's that particular moment feel like? The moment that you actually lift off. Honestly, if I could assign one word to it, it would be the word fulfillment. Because you wow. finally realize you are fulfilling the mission that you came here to do. Now to the incredible story of a military trailblazer. Chanel Jones caught up with the first ever black woman to become commanding officer in the 106 year history of the Naval Station Norfolk. So this is the world's largest naval base. Correct. And you are the first African American woman to be made commanding officer of this base. What does it mean to be the first? It means that I'm not the last. I always takes the first and after that, it's game on. Game on is right. As commanding officer of Naval Station Norfolk, Captain Janet Days manages nearly every aspect of the base, home to the U.S. Atlantic Fleet, with over 56,000 military personnel, 63 ships and submarines, 18 squadrons, and an average of 1,150 ship movements per year. It almost feels like a small city. Think about it as being a mayor. Everything from managing the infrastructure, the supply, the utilities, all the support services, not to mention the operational component and the personnel that come to this space. How'd that go? That went well. Did it well? So one of the people who inspired you to pursue a career in the military is your dad. Absolutely. 
as a little girl growing up, and your dad's an army man, I saw how people responded to him, and so my dad had a huge influence on me joining the military. Raised by a single father, when he was deployed to Vietnam, Captain Days and her siblings were temporarily placed in foster care until he returned. And you know, you realize, and even for me as a parent, the love that he had oh, for you guys. It out. Oh, and the sacrifice it out. that it took. And being in the Army was a means and a way for him to provide for us. All right, thank you. You served as the destroyer squadron and aboard USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, where you did two tours for Operation Enduring Freedom, including a deployment to Afghanistan. I served on board destroyers. That would have been unheard of uh, back in the early 90s because these ships, they go to combat. Today, 30 years later, women serve in multitude of capacities in the Navy. Captain Days gave me a tour of Norfolk's naval ships from the patrol boat. Put this in perspective for me. This is the world's largest naval base. Yeah. Never, ever is there not activity and action happening here 24-7. Ships come in, we repair ships, we supply ships and do upkeep, we do training. Our stretch and our reach is wide. How do you move forward and navigate in a world like this when you don't see anybody else blazing those trails? I had wonderful mentors. They just weren't women and said, you would be great at this. Do you even think about it when sometimes you're the only one who looks like you in a room? No, I'm so used to it. <laughs> yes, I see it, but it doesn't bother me because whatever my purpose is for being there, I'm going to do my job. Her impressive resume includes being the commanding officer of the USS McFall, a warship, and says there were challenges along the way. You've had moments where people would question and say, you know, who's in charge here? And you say, I am. I did have an instance where the pilot boarded the ship, went over to my executive officer and said, hey, Captain, are we, we ready to get underway? And I heard that and I said, we absolutely are. We're ready to get underway, let's do it. He turned beet red. Don't believe it was intentional, but I think it's just the norm. Now, over a month into the new job, Captain Days is still getting used to the attention and says young African-American sailors often ask to shake her hand. They want to shake your hand and they say you're super proud of you. And it's taken a little bit for that to kind of sink in. And women, women of all hues, who come up and shake your hand and they hold your hand and they don't let your hand go. Mm -hmm. I want to make my family and make those proud. And also just let ladies know that you can do it. Oh, ladies, you, <laughs> you can do it. it! We are so pleased to have you here on the plaza. What an honor it is for us to be sitting with you. Chanel, what a great interview you have with her. Will you just put your finger on the moment when you knew that your life was about to change, you were about to be in charge and at the helm? No, it was absolutely amazing. I have a fantastic team at Naval Station Norfolk, and you don't just get there overnight. Yeah. You know, it's a path that you take as you go through various tours. You have advocates, um, people that are rooting for you, and, and the amazing team that works with you. It's absolutely a team sport. Um, but taking command of Naval Station Norfolk was probably the epitome of my career, aside from commanding a warship. I wanted and, to ask you about that because, yeah. I mean, you truly have risen through the ranks in every sense of it. But commanding a warship, we were just talking, you are saying, in a lot of ways, that is the highlight, the mm. pinnacle. No, absolutely, absolutely. The Navy puts an enormous amount of um, just the responsibility on you, but trust that not only are you going to execute the mission, but you're going to bring those sailors home and you're going to take care of them. Mm. And that right there means absolutely everything to me and commanders that are afloat, commanders that are in squadrons, commanders that are on submarines. Um, the nation's um, children are a responsibility. Mm. And sure we can go out and accomplish that mission and take care of them, that is absolutely um, it's something I'll never forget. Still to come, a few fun educators who've gone viral for their creative approaches in the classroom. Stay with us.
Welcome back to The Boost. With the new school year now well underway, we are celebrating some standout educators. First up, Dylan headed to gym class to meet an award-winning teacher who also has quite the social following. Thomas Gillardi, a physical education teacher, has taught for the last nine years at PS 173 in New York and is affectionately known as Coach. Oh, we got a tie over here. Why did you want to become a phys ed teacher? I was always passionate in anything that I did, and I always gravitated towards sports. Soccer was really my game. Once I figured out I wasn't going to be a pro, <laughs> I'm like, what else should I do? And I realized I kind of had a gift working with kids. Like, if I wanted to make them laugh, they'd laugh. If I wanted to make them do things, they'd listen. And I'm like, this is kind of fun. Coach is crushing it. The 2022 Elementary PE Teacher of the Year, who also happens to be a hit on social media. Hi, my name is Coach Gillardi. Creating the Phys Ed Zone in 2018 to help strengthen students mostly through dance movement. After watching kid-friendly exercise videos online with his class, he thought, I can do that. I got a tripod and an iPad, and I did it. And I put it on my own YouTube channel. Welcome to the Phys Ed Zone. More than 22,000 YouTube subscribers and more than 5 million views later, Coach lunges and kicks, claps and jumps to encourage children's health and fitness. Are you ready? <laughs> Two hands, same time. Where did the ideas come from for the movements and everything you're doing? I started asking the students, like, which songs do you want to hear? And I would just kind of say, let's do some free dancing to it. And I'd watch them. And then I'd go to my basement and practice in front of the mirror. So these videos started before COVID? Yes, I had about 25 dance videos. And then COVID happened. Yeah. And everyone had to figure out remote learning. So now I went from teaching my school my community, now I'm teaching everywhere. It was unbelievable. You got it. What do you see in him as a teacher? He really thinks about where phys ed's going to take kids. It's not just a job for him. He really what? is looking to inspire kids for their futures. Why is it important to get kids to play as part of exercise? We're living in a day and age where there's so many other options to avoid being fit. I see my students once a week, maybe twice at best. I know I'm making an impact, but what real impact can I really make in that short period of time? Mm -hmm. Has been really my biggest challenge. On the flip side, Coach educates the next generation of PE teachers through TikTok. Tips for PE teachers. Where he has 74,000 followers and more than 3 million likes. Give it a try. Why did you want to do that? The best way for PE teachers to be prepared to teach is mentorship. So now they have their degree, they're applying for a position, and now they're teaching with really no skills. Why not share basic tips and tricks to help these future professionals? Time for me to get in the phys ed zone. One of the tips you have is a hula hoop hut. Yes. Can you help me make one? Of course. <laughs> I did it! Yeah! Yes, you're a good teacher! Finally, I get to join in imaginative fun and games with Coach and his students. No equipment needed, just a willingness to play along. First activity is called look away. There are lots of whistles. Free. Hopping and laughing. One foot, that's crazy! What? I can't do that! And the real crowd pleaser? Think rock, paper, scissors, plus a flexibility and balance challenge. Banana split. Oh, no! Okay, I got this. Banana split. No! We found another educator who has students bubbling with excitement, a chemistry teacher with his own viral following, thanks to his fun and creative approach in the classroom. When I got into teaching, I did not think I would become a dancer in the chemistry lab with my students. Every week, Professor Andre Isaacs and his students are conducting research. So what are our yields looking like? And learning choreography. All right, I think I can do that. You got it. The Associate Professor of Chemistry at the College of the Holy Cross is fusing pop culture with science lessons on TikTok. The reaction? More than 480,000 followers and more than 4 million views. As an elder millennial, I don't think my body moves the way in which Gen Z's um, do. And you know, in that moment, we're kind of flipping the switch, right? The student became the teacher and the teacher became the student. 
Can somebody come five, six, seven, eight under their breath when she pulls me in? His videos often feature an experiment. I'm going to take this rosé and I'm going to turn it into milk. A history lesson? Let me introduce you to African-American chemist Alma Hayden. And a trending dance. Complete with his popular rainbow lab coat. 80 degrees. 65, actually. 65. But it's not all play. We spend a significant amount of time doing research, and in our downtime, we, we like to create videos. For Professor Isaacs, engaging his students through social media has strengthened his bond with them. They come into our classrooms and they have to make themselves vulnerable about their, you know, intelligence, about, you know, what they know. But that doesn't happen on the other side, right? The faculty member doesn't have to be vulnerable. It was so important to students for me to have like a growth mindset to remind them that I believe in them. They can do this much as my students said, I think you can handle this stance. And that's been kind of a, a guiding principle because now the, you've been, you're more vulnerable with, with their students and so they trust you more. The whole point of the dancing is to meet students where they're at in whatever way ways they need. As a black and queer scientist, the professor is using his platform to create more interest and inclusivity in STEM. I think for a lot of students, seeing someone who holds all these intersectional identities thriving in the space and, and having that sense of belonging is, is really inspiring um, a lot of younger folk. Professor Isaac's mentorship and fun approach to chemistry is what drew his students to the subject. He sees his students and the people in his research groups as true people and really tries to kind of cultivate their interests and passions and what they want to do beyond chemistry. Chemistry in, its, in of itself is difficult and just being able to do chemistry while having fun uh, is something to really enjoy. And for the chemistry professor, that's what success looks like to him. It's very important for us to realize that science can be conducted by anyone, right? And, and it doesn't matter what you look like, it doesn't matter how you identify. I want students to realize that their, whatever they bring is an asset, right? And that science is better when people bring their, their unique qualities and skills to the table. But as far as his dancing goes... He is a little bit of a slow learner, but he is a great dancer. For now, Professor Isaacs is encouraging the next generation of scientists to step into their element. All right, let's do it. Showtime. When we come back, the photographer on a mission to spread more than just smiles. Stay with us. Back here on the booth, spotlighting the power of a picture. Let's take a look at how one photographer is helping a unique group of people 
take pride in who they are. Can you give me a big, big cheese? Say cheese. The saying goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. Right here, Griffin. Hey, buddy. For Texas-based photographer Philip Flores, who formerly served in the Marines, these smiles have become his mission. Last year, Flores founded Down for Smiles, a not-for-profit organization focused on sharing the joy, beauty, and ability within the Down Syndrome community through free professional photos. I hope to give them a voice. I hope to give them hope. I love you. It's a labor of love inspired by Flores' four-year-old daughter, Isabel Grace, the father of two. You have a beautiful smile. Look at you. Now focused on sharing the stories Three, two, one. of people with Down syndrome You're gonna give that to me? through his lens. I saw the beauty and the capability, all the possibilities that Izzy has, possesses, and exudes. And I wanted to show that. He's a, the light of our lives. His photo shoots have taken him across the country, bringing him everywhere from baseball fields to ballet studios to bakeries and to places like Gigi's Playhouse in Sugarland, Texas. We just keep looking at each other. And all to capture his subjects. Is that strawberry? Chocolate? Where they feel most at home. Three, two, one. For parents like Alice Sims. Who's your favorite singer? Down for Smiles is a difference maker. It brings confidence in the children that are taking those pictures, and then it shows the world, you know, the beauty that is Down syndrome. Three, two, one. Giving her 17-year-old daughter Haley the confidence to shine. Three, two, one. Wes and Amanda Hudson. Somebody get tickled right now, hurry. Our grandma and grandpa to 10-year-old Sadie. Give me a big, big, silly smile. Flores' photos help honor their special relationship. We've just always thought she was one of the best miracles in our life. It's a great idea. And then ready, three, two, Look that way. right here, buddy. Right here, Bubba's. The power of each picture celebrating the beauty cheese. and abilities of individuals both inside and out. <laughs> our community is beautiful and it's glorious and it, and it deserves to be a screened from the mountaintops and celebrated. Now we want to shine a light on an organization that's been making dreams come true for nearly a decade. Ruby's Rainbow provides college scholarships to students with Down syndrome. And Al got to sit down with the Ruby who inspired it all. Introducing Ruby Placta. 11 year old Ruby Placta loves an introduction. Her mom, Liz Placta, is her biggest cheerleader. The minute I held Ruby, I knew that I, I needed the world to see what I saw in her. Ruby was diagnosed with Down syndrome the day she was born. I always say, joke that she came early, tiny, and rocking an extra chromosome. As a new mom on this unexpected journey, Liz was determined to understand everything she could about her daughter. Quickly, I just, like, shut all the books. You went on, on I, being mom. I did, and I let I let her, you know, be my guide. She's been the coolest freaking thing ever. I wouldn't change a single hair on your head. I love that. Uh, Mom. <laughs> With this newfound perspective, Liz started planning ahead to help Ruby thrive. I was so interested in, like, her future. About six months old, I looked at my husband, and I was like, I... I think I want to help somebody with Down syndrome go to college. I'm going to help them, you know, go for their dreams. In 2011, Liz and her husband, Tim, created Ruby's Rainbow, a nonprofit that gives partial scholarships to adults with Down syndrome wanting to pursue higher education. 11 years later, Liz has created a community of believers raising hundreds of thousands of dollars every year for Ruby's Rainbow. We gave out 119 scholarships this year, which was a record for us. We gave out, it's crazy, isn't it? We gave out $483,000 in scholarships, which wow. I want to cry just thinking about it. I got it! I got it! Scholarship from Ruby's Rainbow! Oh. Congratulations! <laughs> well, we've given out 599 scholarships. That's over $2 million in scholarships in the past 11 years since this little lady's been born. Recipients go on to complete college programs, a few even getting their associates and bachelor's degrees. And one is going for her master's. The confidence and 
the life skills that they're gaining just by being allowed to go out into the world and make mistakes mm -hmm. and learn from them. Like Don't everybody. Mean, it, like everybody. Today, Ruby is in her first year of middle school and flourishing. <laughs> Ruby, what are your favorite things? I like to be in band. What's your instrument? I play a trombone. Ah. I like that. <laughs> ah. But she's already looking to the future. Ruby, do you want to go to college? I do. What do you want to study, Ruby? I want to be a doctor. She loves getting her blood drawn, so. <laughs> oh, wow, Ruby, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't either. I do. <laughs> Above all, Liz understands how believing in someone like her daughter can change a life. It's an honor for me to help other people with Down syndrome be the wow. best of me. Ruby is the gift that keeps giving. You are the gift that keeps on giving, Rube. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. After the break, another inspiring and fun story that's sure to put a smile on your face. Stay with us. the boost with that one last feel-good story you cannot miss. Check it out. Sometimes it can be kind of tricky to keep young kids on their best behavior when you guys go out to restaurants, but it was not a problem for the little girl you're about to see. In fact, she was all in. I don't know, maybe it was the queso. Uh, the girl is feeling it. it. I'll have what she's oh. had. She's got a flamenco dancer thing. She's got a basket of chips. Oh. Nobody's keeping that her happy. That looks like Jenna oh, Bush Hager when she was little. Yeah. Eating queso for the first oh, time. That is funny. Spot on. Oh, Spot that's on. Beautiful. That's I love cute. it. Yeah. Thanks for joining us for another fun day here on The Boost. We love being able to help lift your spirits each and every day, right here on Today All Day. Thanks for joining us on Consumer Confidential here on Today All Day. I'm Vicki Wynn. We're back with more insider tips and the latest consumer news. From warnings about knockoff weight loss drugs to what you should consider before buying pet insurance. It's all coming your way. But first, I'll look at new technology that aims to make school buses safer for students. This is video from a school bus in North Carolina. Watch as the students on the left attempt to cross the road to board the bus, but then are nearly run over. And this Ohio bus driver hailed as a hero after saving a student from being hit by that car. 
These incidents are known as stop arm violations. A new survey estimates this happens more than 43 million times every year. These stop arm violations can have deadly consequences. According to a government report, 13-year-old Evelyn Gurney was run over and killed by a driver in Wisconsin as she prepared to board her bus. The report stated the stop arm was deployed when the driver swerved around it and struck her. But new technology aims to make it safer for students by enabling buses to communicate directly with cars. I'm here in Indiana at the test track for IC Bus. It's the nation's largest bus manufacturer, and I'm going to show you for the first time how it all works. It's called Cellular Vehicle to Everything, or CV2X for short, and it's being developed by dozens of automakers and tech companies, including Audi and IC Bus. It just takes safety to the next level. With me is Justina Morrison from IC Bus. The bus driver slows down and extends the stop sign. Heading toward us is a car also outfitted with CV2X technology. That screen alerts the bus driver of the approaching vehicle. Near my vehicle in motion. As the car gets closer, the technology senses it has not slowed down, once again warning the bus driver, don't let kids off that bus. High speed vehicle approaching. What is that screen telling the bus driver right now? It's telling the bus driver how fast the car is approaching, how close the car is to the school bus, as well as from what direction that car is approaching the bus. So we saw how this tech works on buses, but what about for drivers of other cars who really need to know where those kids are? With me is Palm Mohotra from Audi to talk about what the experience is like behind the wheel. Palm, how will this prevent crashes? So the technology that we have in the Audi e-tron actually communicates directly with the school bus up to 10 times a second. And it doesn't matter if the driver in the vehicle is actually able to see the other vehicle hmm. or not because it can look around corners, it can sense a vehicle through an obstruction like another vehicle. And this is how we prevent accidents on the road and save lives. Let's see how it works. This time the bus is stopped, but I can't see it because it's hidden from view by that semi-truck. As I approach, I get a warning on my dashboard. Wow, so Palm, I don't even see a bus or any stop signs, but already the car is telling me something's ahead. Exactly, and it's telling you, heads up, you need to slow down. Okay, let's see what happens when I don't slow down. And there's the warning. It gives me an extra time to react, and that can be the difference between life and death. Absolutely. We try it again, now with the semi-truck behind the bus as I maneuver to pass it. This is a very real scenario. A big rig slowed down in front of me, I don't see anything, so I'm just gonna change lanes around it, but. I'm already getting an indication. There's a school bus. Now I'm getting the stop indication. And if I don't stop, there's that alert. And I had plenty of time to stop. And CV2X isn't limited to buses and cars. It can be used to alert drivers to approaching emergency vehicles, upcoming construction zones, bicycles, even pedestrians, as long as they're equipped with the cellular technology but the safety benefit that it delivers on the road is incredible. Incredible safety when everything on the road can communicate so we can avoid scenes like this. The technology is not exclusive to Audi or Navistar. Nearly every automaker is working to get this into their vehicles as quickly as possible. Audi says they're hoping it will be standard technology in their vehicles within three to five years. Now, if you think that's a long time, the FCC actually set aside the bandwidth to make this all possible all the way back in 1999. Next, drugs like Ozempic are being used for weight loss and recently more websites have been selling knockoff versions. But are they safe? These days, it seems like everyone is looking to shed a few pounds. Baby, the hype is real. But as the craze for using diabetes drugs for weight loss grows, so too is the emerging market to get so-called knockoff versions of these popular medications, all without a prescription. A new report by the Wall Street Journal found more than 50 websites selling semaglutide and terzepatide, the active ingredients in diabetes drugs like Ozempic and Manjaro. Anytime demand vastly outstrips supply, entrepreneurs will step into the breach. While nearly all of the websites have disclaimers that the ingredients are not for human consumption, the journal found some had instructions for how people could use the substances on their own. They're not verifying who you are, and they do things like prefer to be paid in Bitcoin. The paper also says at least 18 of the sites have run ads on Instagram and Facebook in recent months, including ones like these from SAF Research, offering huge gains and a buy one, get two free deal on their vials of semaglutide. 
Facebook and Instagram's parent company Meta says they've removed ads for the sites on their platforms after being flagged by the journal. Telling NBC News in a statement reading in part, our policies prohibit the advertisement of prescription drugs without the proper authorization and approval. On its website, SAF Research offers numerous disclaimers stressing their products are not dietary supplements, but instead research chemicals for laboratory use only. But some are choosing to ignore these kinds of warnings. Across the websites they reviewed, the journal found that a month's supply of the ingredients cost around $100 to $200, compared to brand name drugs like Ozempic, which can cost around $1,000 a month without insurance. Lori Sicatello says she was prescribed Ozempic for her type 2 diabetes last year. Months later, she hit an insurance coverage gap, making it too expensive for her. They said now it's going to be $754. So she began taking research-grade semaglutide that her friend found online for about $100 a month. What's really in this? What am I, what am I taking here? By the end of the month, I wasn't comfortable with taking it anymore. The FDA is now sounding the alarm about the potential dangers of buying these ingredients online, saying in a statement that they advise consumers to not purchase peptides marketed as sold for research use and mix, ingest or inject them. There are no FDA approved generic versions of these substances and drug makers Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly say they don't supply their ingredients to companies selling research substances. Earlier this year, our NBC News investigation found more than a dozen telehealth websites advertising Ozempic for weight loss. I experienced firsthand just how easy it was to get these medications online at a low cost. Met my request. I had my Ozempic prescription by the very next day. My producer also got a prescription. This is Jamie. No one ever saw us on video or in person, and neither of us has diabetes or would be medically defined as obese. While it may seem like it's becoming easier than ever to get your hands on these drugs, experts say doing so comes at your own risk. I really advise patients to steer clear of the online versions because we just can't control the quality or the safety in those cases. The Wall Street Journal tells us some of the websites they contacted have already been taken down. We reached out to SAF Research for additional comment. We have not heard back. The website says they use different marketing tools to reach their audience and that none of their ads make claims that could send the wrong message about their products. SAF also emphasizes they do not sell supplements or medications. With so many counterfeit options, Novo Nordis actually launched a website, semaglutide.com, to help people spot the difference between what's real and what's fake. Coming up, is pet insurance really worth it? How to decide if it's right for you. Plus, tips to help college students eat healthier on a budget. Welcome back, Americans. We love our pets, and more owners are now getting pet insurance. But it can be confusing to figure out if it makes sense for you. We help break it down. We love our pets like family. An estimated 111 million American households have a dog or cat. And just like any member of the family, health care is important, but an emergency vet visit can cost between $250 to $1,600. 
It's prompted a booming business in the U.S., pet insurance. The number of policies purchased at the end of last year has risen nearly 93 percent since 2019. It's another kid. You know, I have three daughters and I have Lucy. You got her as a puppy and immediately you thought, this is a good idea to have insurance for our pet. Why? Well, just like you would insure your children. You want to make sure, you know, if something bad happens that they're protected. Jeff Foose purchased a policy from Trupanion, among the nation's largest pet insurance companies. He says his coverage started at $33 a month for Lucy. But after nine years, the cost has risen to almost $80 a month. That's a 141% increase. Foose says in some years, his rate increased more than the 20% his policy said it would never exceed annually. Do you think this was a worthwhile investment? Absolutely not. It can be hard to tell if pet insurance is worth it for you. We requested quotes from five popular companies using Bruno, a three-year-old mixed breed dog. For similar coverage and a deductible between two to $500, take a look at the rates. Embrace at the low end at $41 a month, Trupanion the highest at $167. None covers routine exams. We would absolutely recommend that you get your insurance when you have a puppy or kitten because that's when a pet doesn't have any pre-existing conditions. Margie Tooth is the president of Trupanion. The company brought in almost a billion dollars in revenue last year and says it's paid two billion in claims since the company was founded in 2000. We asked her about Jeff Foose's case and other complaints that Trupanion has raised its premiums to unaffordable levels that are far higher than vet care inflation. You said it's important to your company not to make consumers feel like it's a bait and switch, and yet we have talked to some who feel like they're not getting what they were promised. How do you respond to those criticisms? It's very disappointing to hear that people feel that way. I think we, we work very hard to ensure that we're explaining our value proposition and that we make it clear to people when they sign up with us that your price may change. Do you think there's enough regulation to make this industry uh, transparent and to help consumers really understand the pricing models? I do not. I think it's changing. I think it needs to continue to change more. It's a bad financial product. Kevin Brassler is executive editor for Consumers Checkbook, a nonprofit providing price research and consumer advice. In the case of pet insurance, we found that overall, compared to the payouts and the premiums you have to pay and all the other out-of-pocket expenses, they're generally really bad deals for most pet owners. Do you think it's a better idea to set aside some money in a rainy day fund rather than paying these premiums? Yeah, I mean, you're going to do far better off financially in the long run by taking those premiums that you'd pay to pet insurance companies and just saving them and taking care of your pet's costs out of pocket. If you want to buy pet insurance, Brassler says check accident-only policies to cover emergencies like car accidents or poisoning and look for a higher deductible plan to lower your monthly payments. Foos says he would have been better off with a rainy day fund. If you had just paid out of pocket for Lucy's incidents, mm -hmm. would you be ahead? I'd be ahead of about $2,300, $2,400. We reached out to Embrace. They told us their policies provide peace of mind and like insurance for homes, cars, and people, pets should be protected too. Up next, healthy and budget-friendly meal ideas for college students. And later, a look at what's fueling the growth in popularity of stick shifts. Consumer Confidential continues after this break.
Welcome back to Consumer Confidential. College students, they're not making the grade when it comes to healthy eating. So I hit the grocery aisles with a chef who specializes in healthy and budget-friendly meals. With nearly 3 million freshmen expected to attend college this fall, many students will live on their own for the very first time. A fresh taste of freedom served with a full plate of new responsibilities. Gail Cresci, a registered dietitian at Cleveland Clinic Children's, says as first-year students adapt to college life, some may struggle to maintain a healthy diet, a time I remember all too well. It was a lot of pizza, it was a lot of cookies, it was a lot of eating late at night, and a lot of contributing factors to the so-called freshman 15. Where are some areas that calories like to hide and sneak into a first-year student's diet? We find hidden calories in things like alcohol. Another area is with coffee. You may get some of those extra syrup flavorings, a whipped cream that's on those coffees. We see a lot of extra calories with fast food. What are three things you might advise a first year student when it comes to eating healthy? Avoid eating late at night if at all possible. And you're going to be hungry during the day, so to have some healthy snacks available that are quick grab and go. Another thing is to make sure you're drinking adequate water. She also recommends eating 20 to 30 grams of protein at each meal, which equals about three ounces of chicken breast or lean beef. This is where you live okay. when you're in college. We've called on chef, TV personality, and senior food editor for Budget Bites, Monte Carlo. Monty, class is in session. Yeah. Clearly we got the assignment. You're at Cale University. Okay, School of Hard Knocks. Yes, I'm representing University of San Francisco. So you say that when kids are off on their own for the first time, mm -hmm. often cooking on a budget, you got to start with an A-plus grocery list. You have to start with an A-plus grocery list. And the best part is it's a really cheesy, easy one. Let's go. Let's start with fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. It's important to eat nutritiously, yes. but this stuff is expensive and it doesn't always last a long time. No, it doesn't. This has the life of like a Disney star, what, like 24 hours? But the best deal for you when you want berries in your life is to go frozen. These fresh blueberries cost about five bucks a pound, but for the same price, you can buy three times that amount frozen, adding them to oatmeal, yogurt, or smoothies. Let's talk about packaged produce. Yes. What's your tip here? Do not do it. It's a no-no? No, come on, you're gonna pay like five dollars for four little pieces of corn when you could buy this for 59 cents a pop, right? Ah. Just peel it, bro. It's not that hard. And right. if you have a microwave, you have fabulous fresh corn. Carlo, who teaches college cooking classes, says when it comes to appliances, every dorm room or apartment also needs a coffee pot. You can use it to make soups. You can use it to make eggs. Anything that you would stew or heat up in a pot, you can make in a coffee pot. <laughs> The next part of our lesson, a study of hot deals on frozen meals. A staple of college life is pizza. pizza. But you don't want to be dialing that pizza delivery company. No. One pepperoni pizza is $17. You can get three for $10. Carla suggests stocking up on a variety of store brand frozen vegetables to use as pizza toppings. It's starting to feel kind of gourmet. Okay. Or as a way to help another college classic earn some extra credit. Are you ready for the pop quiz? I guess so. Which country consumes the most ramen per person per year? USA? No! Vietnam! Yes! We love our ramen. Costing three bucks for six servings, Carlo partially cooks the noodles and divides them into mason jars with the veggies. When you're ready to eat, you add a little water, a little broth, you put it in the microwave, and you're set. So you just pre-make these ramen jars? Yes using your noodle to find a cart full of savings. Winning. Class dismissed. Ah! For other budget-friendly tips, consider shopping store brands and downloading the store's app for extra savings. Also, shop the less popular cuts of meat, like chicken thighs or sirloin tip steaks, and add beans to meat dishes for more bulk and protein. Now, let's switch gears to the recent growth in popularity of stick shifts. I hadn't driven a stick in nearly 20 years, so we found the best instructor to rev up my skills, a NASCAR champion. Drift, slide, side to side. But before we get into my skills behind the wheel, let's revisit that time in 2019. When Dylan and Al taught Craig and Chanel how to drive with a manual transmission. I didn't even feel you change it. Because I'm that good. As for me in 2023, you decide. Let's take it for a spin. All right.
right, all right. So that's not exactly how it went, but I was in for some fun. Today, we're outside City Field here in Queens, New York, and this this is the brand new Mustang Dark Horse. It is a manual transmission car. I can't wait to take it for a spin. Problem is, the last time I drove a stick was 15 years ago. But lucky for me, look who we have here, NASCAR Hi. driver, Coca-Cola 600 champion, Ryan Blaney. Hi, thank you so you? much for being here. Yeah. So there is a rise in interest in these manual transmission cars. What's the appeal, Ryan? I feel like the appeal of manuals is it kind of makes the driver feel one with the car. You're engaged. It, yeah, that's a great word. It makes you very engaged with the car. So I'm really excited to show you around it. Okay, so you'll stay with me as I kind of like go oh, through yeah. the bumps? I got you. <laughs> All right, let's do it. it. All right. I'm the first TV journalist to drive the dark horse. I know, tough assignment. What is the first thing I should be thinking about? So first thing is left foot in on the clutch. Okay. As you're letting your left foot off the clutch, and you know, your right foot's going down to the gas and it's like on an even motion. And so a lot of people kind of dump the clutch and that's when you get like the big perky jerky. Did you bring a bar bag? Yeah. There we go, all right, all right. You know, it's like riding the bike. I'm picking it back up again. Yeah. And you know what? This, I have to pay attention when I'm driving a stick. There's no time for texting and being on the phone. Your right hand's working, your left hand's on the steering wheel. You're not gonna be on your phone, right? While stick shifts accounted for 1.3% of sales in the U.S. in June, searches for new manual cars are up 13%. It's a bright spot in an otherwise downward trend. In 2000, more than 15% of new and used cars sold by CarMax were manual. By 2020, it was only 2.4%. Compare that to electric vehicles, which now make up 5% of car sales. Let's switch gears and have you show me how it's really done. Okay, yeah? let's do it. <laughs> but before we do, Ryan revs up the settings on the car. Ooh, you put it on some sort of race flag mode. We're gonna have some fun. I'm excited. You can't do worse than I did. I actually went off the track. Woo, yeah, here we go. So what mode are we in right now? Woo, super fun mode. Yeah, super fun mode. What do I smell? Is that like rubber? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was like real life Fast and Furious, Ryan. Yeah, I don't recommend anyone doing that. On Definitely. The but we were here, we were safe, and I'm happy you had fun. Ford's manual transmission Bronco is also seeing a spike in interest. There's a lot more people ordering them, and you can definitely tell that they're becoming more popular. Autumn Schwalbe is a future product planner for Ford's performance cars. She says, aside from the fun of driving a stick, manuals can be cheaper, too. On average, stick shifts cost nearly $1,800 less than automatics. What are your friends saying about manual transmission? I do know a lot of people that are super willing to learn at my age. As for me, I finished in victory lane. I didn't have to do much teaching, so I was, I'm just happy I just get to sit here and ride. Best journalist driver of the day? By far. <laughs> Your check will be in the mail later. <laughs> Up next, a mom creating diverse and inclusive dolls for everyone. On the heels of Barbie mania, there's renewed interest in dolls, and I recently met a mom on a mission to make playtime more inclusive. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Ken. 
Barbie's blockbuster summer brought dolls back into the spotlight. And a look at what's for sale now reveals a slew of new toys, from dolls for boys and female action figures to Miniland's dolls representing children with Down syndrome and Mattel's fashionista line featuring a doll in a wheelchair. Even Lego spreading love to the LGBTQIA community with this Everyone is Awesome set. In a $40 billion industry, 50% of parents rank diversity and representation as a top consideration when toy shopping. I was just shocked by the fact that I couldn't find a single doll that I thought looked remotely like any Asian child I know. Eleanor Mack says last year, while shopping for a doll resembling her now three-year-old daughter, Jillian, she was disappointed. You only knew those dolls were Asian because they had a name like Ling, or they were holding a panda bear, or they had that really bad blunt haircut. Yeah! <laughs> American Girl produced Corinne Tan, a Chinese-American doll in 2022, in part to help kids deal with anti-Asian racism. But Mack says the doll's backstory highlights the Chinese father's lack of work during the pandemic. Her Chinese-American father is this struggling ski instructor in Aspen who effectively can't provide for the family. The mom gets a divorce, remarries a wealthy white guy named Arnie. Wow, I did not know the backstory of that doll. Your reaction is exactly how I felt. And it wasn't just the backstory. And when I looked at that doll, the big round eyes, the skin color, she just didn't look Asian. American Girl telling NBC News the Corinne backstory was written by an Asian American author and designers consulted with her and an anti-Asian racism expert, among others, on Corinne's hairstyle and color, skin tone, and a new eye sculpt to more authentically reflect her Chinese American heritage. The company adding the doll has received an overwhelmingly positive response from fans. I wanted our children to be proud of their Asian eyes, to know that they are beautiful. Mac decided to make the doll she wishes she had as a girl, working with other Asian American parents to design, develop, and source the materials. Just a year after coming up with the idea for an Asian American doll who loves to bake with her grandmother, Mac introduced the world to Jilly Bing. What was your daughter's reaction when she saw this doll for the first time? She just gasped and she's like, Jilly, she looks like me. You want to color in Jilly Bing? Mac eventually left her job in healthcare. Now her San Francisco home is Jilly Bing headquarters. How many dolls in this house right now? Three or 400. Um, we started out with close to 2,000. So she has a little chef's hat that flips over and becomes this little <laughs> who doesn't love an egg tart. Exactly. Jilly Bing becoming part of a trend of non-white dolls originating in the 1960s. We're seeing games, we're seeing puzzles. And it's really starting to broaden the horizon so that kids can go into a store and they're going to see toys that really reflect the real world that we all live in. James Zahn, senior editor at the Toy Insider, says consumer spending has convinced toy makers to invest the time and money it takes to develop more inclusive products. When kids are able to play with toys that look like themselves or look like their family, their friends, whoever they're seeing in the community, I think that it just sort of works with their own development in thinking of the world as a very diverse place. And when those toys step beyond stereotypes, they can have a lasting impact for generations. And that's our time for now. Be sure to join me for another edition of Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. For all of us here at NBC News, I'm Vicki Nguyen. When most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coneys in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So what makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit style Coney in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal 
has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace! Al! Hi, good to see you again. It's been a long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis, setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're going to go into the hot dog business, but we're going to top it with something Greek now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kiros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history, from national to Kirby's to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island to L. George's to Leo's and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a Coney dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. Is we that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people so good, a little upset with us. I'm like, Dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? 
it was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know how to read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. You know, we're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili's a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. OK. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments, people, about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating, thanks to my grandpa, because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America, and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soteropoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learn how to make the quintessential cone. One up! Right there, nice shot. Yeah. At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of Coney's. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing, yes, it's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lamb skin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Got, uh, pork, beef, and a and That's lamb. That's right. 
And that's what makes it pop. Like when you bite into it, oh, it snaps snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun, it's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. That's they, what we were taught. They're in a oh, steamer. You know, there's steamer. just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're going to pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little. Grab your plate. Yes. All right, so we're going to grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to I want to watch the top. Okay, give it a little mix. Little, this is that. Little zhuzh. Greek, yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend? Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime. Nothing, nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom. Okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. My turn. Get a plate. I need one up, which means I one. need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it. Chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, El. Little All more. Right, that's not too bad. Okay. <laughs> Boom. All right, now keep, I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. Oh, you want the chili to go in. Yeah, you want the chili. You want it, yeah. You want that You're chili. Don't chintz out on that yeah, chili. Little, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier for uh, you to pour over there. All right. There. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right. Exactly. And mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. There, yeah, nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life-changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six inch hot dog bun. At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer Bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. 
In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal, they're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid-80s. This summer, we're gonna be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. There you go, you did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotine, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced, you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family and family employees, that's what John is. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. It's really nice being run by a family on business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together. We, you know, we get down in the dirt. You know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits, and we learn from each other, and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney's, right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and grandparents, family time. Coney dogs go. That's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of 
product that we're sending out each day from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night. I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth, just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, or my kids' kids, have them look back, at family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool county spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan coney spot in the coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife Shelly, along with their daughter Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were gonna open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. 
So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much. We're partners in crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior, to reflect like my basement or my living room where you can come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with this food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite, you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. This just tasted so similar to the wood as a, a regular Pony Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat, yeah. you know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> and we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? This chili? is beyond uh, crumble, uh -huh. a plain beyond crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us, but it's been tough, yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying. We're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay. And welcome to The Boost, I'm Craig Melvin. Happy to be filling in for Hoda today on National Good Neighbor Day. So of course, we're gonna celebrate people making positive impacts in their communities showing us all what it truly means to be a good neighbor. And kicking things off, today's Donna Ferrison. She headed to upstate New York, showing up unannounced to surprise a beloved neighbor. This is so exciting, ladies. I'm here with Amy Mooney, who nominated Ernie for National Good Neighbor Day. We are walking up to his door right now. I'm gonna leave you right there, Amy, okay? And I'm going up. I am. Um... We were hiding in the bushes for quite some time, a little bit nervous of what was gonna happen and how he's gonna react. 
Amy said that he's gonna be in shock. So I'm gonna knock on the door right now and hopefully Ernie will come out and be surprised. We can't wait. There's a crowd of over 30 here with us. This neighborhood loves him so much. And I don't know how he's gonna react, but I'm hoping he's gonna be happy. So let's see what Ernie has to say. We're not that surprised. Hi, Ernie! Surprise! Hi. Ernie, come on out here! I'm Donna. I'm Donna from the Today Show. And you were live Come on over here with me, Ernie. It's so nice to meet you. You are so beloved, as you can feel and see. And I don't know if you know this, Ernie, but we can go right here. It is National Good Neighbor Day today, and we wanted to honor you because you are a pillar of this community, and you are just about the best neighbor that anyone could ask for. What's going through your mind right now? Well, total confusion. <laughs> but let me play in a little bit more. Amy right here, Amy right here nominated you. You are on live television on the Today Show right now. You can wave hi to Hoda and Jenna and, uh, and millions of Americans if you want. We're all here to honor you. Well, thank you very much. And um, if I had any influence in anything, I'd ask them if they'd please throw some fastballs to Aaron Judge. <laughs> they walked him four times last night. And I'm here. But anyway, I Jenna want to say something too so we just are going to give you uh, these air buds so you can listen to okay. what's going on um, we know that you are so beloved and like a father figure to so many here and I actually wanted to show you a little video on why Amy nominated you let's take a look Ernie is a local legend in Rensselaer he is not only a phenomenal neighbor, but a true hero in our community. He was a teacher for over 30 years, and he was also an active volunteer firefighter. He was our fire chief. My kids would play wiffle ball in his backyard. Ernie's like a dad to a lot of us, and he would do anything for any of us. Ernie and his wife, Jan, moved into the neighborhood that was almost 20 years ago, and unfortunately, Jan was stricken with ovarian cancer, and it took her way sooner than any of us thought. And Ernie was crushed. He's not having the retirement he planned on with Jan, but he still celebrates life every day. He's infamous for his mustache. His grandchildren can celebrate his mustache. They play in the snow and they make his face on trees. We are Boston fans. Ernie is a Yankee fan, so there's a, a healthy rivalry going on. Ernie's sense of humor can be summed up in a card that our daughter received at Johns Hopkins Hospital. He sent her a beautiful get well card and signed it Derek Jeter. Ernie is a person who has gone above and beyond, and now it's time for us to honor him. He's gonna be so pissed at me. You have no idea. <laughs> is that true? How do you feel right now? <laughs> I'm overwhelmed, honestly. Yeah. I know. I, I totally, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I have uh, my response was, who the hell's at my door at this time? <laughs> it was us. There are a lot of, a lot of um, iterations of the mustache everywhere. And I know um, your late wife, Jen, would be so proud of all that Thank you've you done so much. today Thank and you. all the love you're receiving today. Thank you so much. Have you always loved the Rensselaer this yes, much? Yes, I have. Yeah. Yes. My father um, was um, born in Rensselaer and before it was Rensselaer, actually. Oh. And um, no, I've lived through all my life and it's a wonderful city. The well, people are just great. I taught 33 years in the schools and um, was in the fire department now pushing 60 years. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, it's just a wonderful town. Well, thank you for all that you do. You're such a great representation of not thank only this so town, much. but a good neighbor. <laughs> and, you know, I wanted you to put the earbuds in one more time okay. because I heard, Ernie, that you were a big Yankees fan. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. So, um, well, in honor of that, I think there's a member of the team that wanted to say hello to you, if that's okay. Let's take a listen. 
Hey, Ernie, it's Nasty Nestor here with the New York Yankees. I just want to congratulate you on being a good neighbor. We've heard all about you and what you've, do and what you've done with, with the community. Um, by the way, we have a special gift coming for you. So stay tuned and go Yankees. Well, I know that you just saw Nestor That's Cortez just... Jr. through the screen, but you know what? Um, can we just grab some Yankee swag? Okay, this is for you. I think you're gonna need it because, Ernie, we are getting you four tickets to Yankee Stadium so you can go and see Nestor. And you have a lot of people to choose from to take with you. How do you feel? I'm, I'm honest to God, I'm overwhelmed. I, I mean, I totally didn't see any of this coming. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, thank you so much for being a great neighbor. Well, I've As had great neighbors around me. It's been pretty easy. To, all the people around me, they're wonderful people. As we send it back to yep. Hoda and Jenna, um, is there one piece of, of advice you would give people to become a better neighbor? If you just look out for each other, if you look and see if somebody's up against it, try to help them a little bit. You can do it quietly. You don't have to make a big fuss. And if just people were nicer to each other all over, Thank it's easy you, to do. Bernie. It's easy to do with you. Thank you. It's time for another surprise. Donna also teamed up with one of our viewers who wrote into the show to honor a dear friend. And we gave her the surprise of a lifetime. I'm so excited. I'm just steps away from Linda Lizzo's door. I'm here with Linda, her friend, and 15 to 20 of her loved ones and friends. By the way, I just want to point out as I'm walking to Linda Lizzo's door to surprise her, these are not neighbors. They have driven from all over Long Island just to see her because they said they would do anything for Linda as she would do for them. So we're about to surprise her and I can't wait. Oh, I hear a dog barking. She has no idea we're here. She thinks Linda, her friend, is in Florida right now. I hear the door opening. The door is unlocking. Hi, Linda, open up. <laughs> we won't bite. <laughs> okay, we're hoping that she's gonna open the door in any moment, right here, right here, just keep right on knocking. Right this is how authentic of a surprise this is, by the way. I mean, she could be putting on a robe right now. We don't even know she's dressed. We hope she is. Hi, Linda. Watching you I right now. I Come on over Just here. <laughs> yes, well, at the moment not, but yes, we're <laughs> And this is what the surprise is I'm all about. I'm not in Florida now, but I, I had to be here. I'm not reading a book. Come with you because you are the best. And we love you. And that's why we're all here. Linda. It's because of you. Did you know that? It's because of you. Linda, I just want to show you because I know that I know your friend Linda just told you what's happening, but we're with all of your loved ones and friends. And we just want you to take a look at this tape. Linda told us, wrote into the show all about you. So let's take a look at this first. There's no better person and no better friend than Linda Lizzo. She is the funniest person I know. If there's a way she can help you, she will. She takes off from work to take a neighbor for doctor's appointments. She gives up her lunch hour to go with somebody who needs some help. My husband was very ill for a very long time. She was there almost on a daily basis. She brought me my favorite muffins, coffee she knows I love, which when you have someone in the hospital for so long, those things really help. It made a bright light in my day when my husband passed away. Lynn was right there. And then my father passed away a month later, unexpectedly. Sometimes just sitting there listening to the memories meant a great deal to me. Linda's son has autism and my son was diagnosed with autism. She went to some trainings with me. She connected me with different places. I think that's a special quality that people see in her, that anyone can approach her and she cares. 
It's going to be wonderful to surprise Linda. She deserves this. Linda, I love you. You mean the world to me. I know you don't like the attention, but you deserve this and enjoy the moment. We all love you, Linda. This will be her reaction. Oh my gosh. She's going to be shocked. She's going to be shocked. Oh my gosh. Linda, we love you so much. We You're so lovely. Gosh. What's going on in your mind right now? Holy crap. And where is it? you didn't swear. Well, let me just tell you, Linda, you are so beloved. You are so beloved. We all know how much you put others' needs ahead of yours. And so we thought that you needed some me time, some alone time, okay? <laughs> so we are sending you on a trip. What do you think about going to Hilton Head, South Carolina? Ooh. Really? Yeah. Head, Hilton Head, oh sorry, Beach House Hilton Head are giving you and a guest a four night stay at their beachside hotel. You'll get a food and beverage credit. Not only that, but Hilton Head Island Visitor and Convention Bureau is providing you with airfare for two, so you get to choose one other person. And that's not all. We want you to feel pampered. So we're just sending you to the spa. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know, as we... I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> well, as we send it back to Hoda and Jenna, if you want to say hi to them, and just thank you for being oh, so, so beloved. Thank you for doing all that you do. Hi, Linda. Okay. Thank you, Hoda and Jenna. Love you. Thank you. Welcome back to The Boost. We are marking Good Neighbor Day with a story about a celebration that one little girl will never forget. Hi guys, did you get bubbles? These were the moments just before the big reveal. Gather by Ellie's house with the big sign. In this neighborhood near Seattle, the whole community turned out to celebrate one little girl. See her there in that car? That's Ellie Hoffman pulling up to her own surprise seventh birthday party. Her parents, Justin and Nicole, had just moved the family there and were overwhelmed by the support. When you saw Ellie's face, Justin, that day, yeah, what was that like? It was so exciting to, to watch her just explode with joy. <laughs> It was very emotional. It was very special because I knew I couldn't do what I wanted to do for her. My friends, the fellow mamas, uh, my community, my neighborhood, they all rallied with me. Oh, I love it. And the whole Hoffman family, you guys are just uh, such an amazing blessing to this community and we love you guys so much. They rallied because Nicole had been fighting cancer and was too weak to plan the party of Ellie's dreams. So instead, she posted on social media, asking neighbors to send Ellie a few cards. Moms Melanie Panito and Renee Carter decided to do a whole lot more. Why do you feel you have to do more than just cards? This is just what people do. They step up and help each other out when things get tough. And I looked at, at Mel and just said, can we do something different? Like, let's, let's throw our party. She said, yep, absolutely. And it really just took off. Happy birthday to you. 
For Ellie, it was a day she'll never forget. What was your favorite part of that whole day, Ellie? Everybody uh, made me have the best ball day ever. <laughs> a community united in tough times and showing the true meaning of friendship. It makes me feel so strong and able to keep um, to keep fighting even. I live with cancer, so it's it's just so special to know that I have some of my family to just help me get through whatever um, comes. And this next story is about two elementary school librarians whose love of books connected them in an unexpected way. Take a look. The playground at Sumas Elementary School looks more like a water park. It's so badly damaged, it will never reopen. After severe flooding destroyed Sumas Elementary School in Washington State last November, the whole community was devastated. There are so many memories that happen in a school really important moments in our lives that you realized aren't going to happen anymore <laughs> in that space. And the school library was especially hard hit. When you spend that many years in, in a room and all of a sudden it's taken away from you, it's, it's like they ripped your heart out. For Kathy Brockema, the Sumas Elementary Librarian, the loss of her beloved books was heart-wrenching. They made this huge pile right in the middle of the floor and that pile got bigger and bigger and bigger. Throughout the Sumas community, hundreds of homes and dozens of businesses were damaged, yet neighbors showed up to help the school. The day that we all came back to the building was um, a day I'll never forget. Yet, the goodness that came out of that, so over 100 people in our community helped us move. And just 10 miles to the west, Jen Frombley, a fellow elementary school librarian, took notice. I saw some pictures of a classroom where the water was almost up to the sink. And so pretty much the entire school was destroyed. I was driving to work one day, listening to worship music, praying, and all of a sudden it was just donate money to the Sumas Library. I believe that was not a Jen thought, that was a God thought. A thought made possible thanks to the scholastic book fair she had just held at Bernice Voss Beth Elementary School in Linden. The kids were so excited because it had been so long since we've had that kind of event for them to, to enjoy. Jen received 5,000 scholastic dollars to spend on books and supplies as proceeds from the fair, which she decided to split with Sumas Elementary. So she wrote a note to Kathy, a woman she had never met before. Kathy, I can't even imagine what you're going through with the loss of your library. We just had a book fair and would like to donate 2,500 scholastic dollars to your library. It totally took my breath away. I. I think the hair stood up on my arms, you know, one of those chills, like, oh my gosh. This is the right thing to do. There was no question for me. That money went a long way. I mean, I was able to buy hundreds and hundreds of books. So when they give me the okay, those books are the first ones to go on the shelves. A simple act of kindness that forever bonded these two librarians. I have put a gift plate in every single donated book if I know the person that gave it to our library, their name is in that book as a thank you. We came from this dark place where we had this flooding, but look at what we were able to do as a community. The generosity that everybody has shown, there's no way to thank everybody enough for what they've done. I mean, librarians saved the world. And now with us is <laughs> Kathy Brockema, Sumas Elementary Librarian. Kathy. I know wow. looking at those images of your beloved library mm -hmm. broke your heart, but what did it feel like to have all of these people come together mm -hmm. right afterwards to help you, including a complete stranger? Yeah. There were a lot of strangers that were there helping clean up. And the part that made me feel so grateful was they were giving up their time yeah. when their own homes were underwater waiting for their cleanup. That's incredible. They took care of the school before they took care of their own homes. I love the woman we featured in the piece. Her name was Jan, and said Jen, she said Jen she probably. got... Did you ever get a chance to say I've hey to her? I never met her, and she's probably only 15 miles away. Well, she's actually closer than 15 miles away right now. Hey, Jen, you want to come <laughs> say hello? <laughs> come on over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
so nice I to meet you. <laughs> you made such a difference in our lives. Oh. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank oh you. Oh, my gosh. My pleasure. What a moment that was, Jen, when you said you were listening to worship, worship music driving along and then it just came to you. Yeah, I, I really think of that as a God thought, not a Jen thought. Yeah. Like, I loved that beautiful yeah. sentence in that because it, it, but you know what? <laughs> you can have a thought yeah. that feels like a God thought yeah. and then there's action. Yeah. Yeah. What did your kids think when they knew they were helping <laughs> this incredible librarian and all these kids get the books they, they deserve? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't, I, I felt like it was the right thing to do. And so I didn't tell the kids to start with oh. until Scholastic contacted me and they asked, what was the reaction of the kiddos? Mm -hmm. And so then I, I told each class separately and most of them broke out in applause. Oh, uh, one wonderful. student literally leaned forward in her seat and said, I, are we gonna help them? <laughs> are we gonna help them? Just ahead, a special story from our vault and Mr. Harry Smith, don't go anywhere. Back on the boost with a feature from the vault and our beloved Harry Smith. Harry headed to Dallas, Texas to meet a woman using her father's handcrafted tables to bring her community together. Lee Harmeyer thought he was retired until his daughter Sarah called the former computer executive one day and said, Dad, can you make me a table? Though he had only dabbled in woodwork, he made two. He's made 241 of them since. I didn't think she was going to need that many, but now I've built over 200 of them. <laughs> Sarah had just moved to Dallas. She used an app to invite a few neighbors to come over to get acquainted. I literally on the invitation was as honest as this. I'll have live music, bring a beverage, bring a dish to share, and we'll have a potluck. Well, 91 people showed up that night. Stop it. And in that moment, I realized people just want to be invited. They want to be a part of things. She had just quit her job, was looking for something new. Then and there, her heart told her to start a business based on a very old idea. I think 2,000 years ago, we were given this invitation to love our neighbors, and I want to take that to heart. Neighbor's Table was born. Tables meant to serve much more than food. Everyone's got a place setting, so find your name. How does this fit into how divisive it feels in the country right now? Our culture right now is figuring out how am I different from you? What a table does, it's like this great equalizer. And it says, how am I similar to you? 
and I invite people to do a lot of listening at the table. Sarah delivers them all, and today she brought one to Shannon and Luke Burton's place outside of Dallas. I want to make sure all of you guys know each other real briefly. She um, wants to be there for the first meal God, and to let all know all right, the table well, has a mission. God, that those that would gather here would know love, would know what it feels like to be included and to feel connected with others. Shannon had looked at tables online for months, but kept coming back to Sarah's website, where there is no click to purchase. And so you have to send an email and she replied back and you know what she wanted to know? I want to know who's going to be sitting around the table. And I thought, wow, this is unique and different. Who does that? That evening, the Burtons and their children shared their new table with a reporter and a few friends, including Alicia, who told us why this idea of a neighbor's table was just so important. And oftentimes, um, I used to wonder, why didn't anyone invite me to the table? At that moment, we knew the table and the people around it were fulfilling its purpose. There's two ways to live. We can either live in love or we can live in fear. And people ask me all the time, well, Sarah, how can you invite the guy that just sacked your groceries to come join you at the table? I'm like, why not? Here's two new friends that feel like family. I want to be a welcome mat kind of person and not a closed door. Welcome back to The Boost. It is our favorite time of the day. Check out this feel-good story, sure to leave you with a smile. Guys, the stage was set for a romantic marriage proposal. A man named Kevin brought his girlfriend to a beautiful clearing in the Swiss mountains. Look at that. After a champagne toast, he then okay. dropped to one knee and he began to propose. Okay. And that is when an uninvited <gasps> guest <laughs> crashed the party. <laughs> yep. It's a ghost. Oh, no. It steps in front of the camera, then knocks it over. Well, Kevin, our groom, sees what's going on. He rushes over to address it. He says he was initially bummed out that the goat ruined the moment, but then he said all things considered, you know. It's pretty it, hilarious. It wasn't that bad. Oh! Did you come that on the spot? You've yes. been working with you know, Roku too long. I know. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed today's show and feel inspired to spread some joy in your neighborhood. And be sure to join us again tomorrow, right here on Today All Day. I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and each week I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. I'm Shop All Day contributor Makon Jovu, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media in influencer trends. I'm Shop Today editorial director Adriana Brock, and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in editor's picks. This is Shop All Day Multitasker. I'm Chassie Post, and we're back today with a new episode of Shop All Day. 
all about multitaskers. Now, these are the items that literally do the most. You know, the fashion pieces that take you from one outfit to the next, and the makeup must-haves that really do the work for you. Wait until you see what made the list. From a jumpsuit that I just love to a three-in-one makeup must-have. And remember, see that QR code in the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today, or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. Okay, let's start with fashion. I found the best closet staple you can wear all year long. Meet the Mango Pop T-shirt bodysuit. And I am a huge fan of our first multitasker. You can pair it with virtually everything in your closets. And bodysuits in general have become such a big trend. We've seen them everywhere, and they are the perfect modern foundation piece. They're so flattering. And here's what I like so much about this bodysuit from Mango Pop. It's got that crew neck t-shirt look. So it's essentially an elevated take on your favorite crew neck t-shirt. It's got a little stretch to it. And I can vouch for the comfort for this bodysuit. A lot of people get hung up on the snaps, but I own three, and I gotta tell you, it's really comfortable. Another thing I love about this bodysuit, it's infinitely versatile. I mean, you can wear it to work with a midi skirt or a pair of trousers. You can wear it for a night on the town with a pair of high-waisted jeans, heels, maybe a statement earring. Or also you can wear it with shorts and they come in so many great colors. Both neutrals that you're gonna use again and again and it comes in inclusive sizing, extra small to XXL. Okay, another major multitasker and essential. The perfect layer to throw over your bodysuit. If you've been looking for that perfect classic button down, I've found the one for you. Now this button down is destined to become the workhorse of your spring and summer and fall wardrobe. Yes, we all need an easy grab and go shirt in our closet that is ready for every occasion. And this boyfriend button down is it. And I gotta say, what I love so much about it is it has this cool girl effortless vibe. It's a boyfriend silhouette, which means it's slightly oversized. So it's not too big, but it's still really flattering. And this linen-like fabric, which is super light. Now, there are a million ways you can wear this shirt. So where does a button down, buttoned up, you know, tuck it in, do that half tuck that you're seeing everywhere. Wear it untucked, sort of like a tunic. And it's got that great shirt tail hem, which means it's longer in the back, which makes it a great shirt to wear with leggings if you want a little bit more coverage. Now you can also wear it as a layering piece when you wear it unbuttoned. So wear it over a tank and shorts. You can even wear it over a bathing suit. Now my favorite thing about this shirt is the high-end details. It's got this classic Safari style. So it's got the two chest pockets. It's also got a convertible sleeve so you can wear the sleeve all the way down or you can cuff it with this cute button tab which I think gives it you know, a little something extra. And it's got this great pleated detail in the back. And it comes in so many fabulous colors. I love the army green, but there's a color for everyone. So next up is a must have for the person on the go, the jumpsuit. And this trend isn't going anywhere soon because it's just so easy. You throw it on and you're done. And this black jumpsuit just might win the award of the most versatile item you could ever wear in your closet. It can go anywhere. You can dress it up, you can dress it down. You can wear it to work with a blazer and a loafer and flats. You could wear it out to dinner or to a party with some layered necklaces and heels. You can wear it lounging around your house. It's like your wardrobe BFF. This jumpsuit is also incredibly comfortable. I have one and I never want to take it off. It's perfect for travel and it comes in lots of colors. But if you really want to make a splash, check out this bright cobalt blue. It's one of the colors of the season and I think it is so fun to mix in a pop of color into your spring wardrobe. 
So next, we've got a shoe that I am so excited about. If you're looking to upgrade your shoe game this spring, then you're gonna love these fabulous mules. And I think that these are just so incredibly stylish. Look at the pointed toe, look at the buckle detail. These are a faux suede, they come in two styles, a kitten heel and also a flat slide mule. And I love these hot pink. If you're looking to add a pop of color to your wardrobe, I always feel like accessories are one of the most affordable ways to experiment with trends. And I mean, hot pink buckle mules, the cutest. Next, you're not gonna believe this. The perfect buy for the person on the go. Take your regular lunch bag and upgrade it. So check this little bag out. It's from Calpac. And when you look at it, at first you might think, oh, isn't that an adorable bucket purse? But guess what? It's actually an insulated lunch bag. Yes, I mean, what a chic way to carry your lunch. I think these are such stylish options. Now the brand says that these are water resistant and the interior has lots of great pockets. It's insulated. And how fabulous are these wonderful colors and patterns? I love a little polka dot, as you can see. And I love the lavender. They also come in a leopard, lots of great neutrals. They're great for taking your lunch to work or carrying snacks around town or for a fashionable picnic in the park. And this bag's so cute, you may even be tempted to use it even when you're not packing food. Okay, we've made fashion simple and functional, so on to multitasking beauty. So this is the Play Bento Trio from Kaja, and it's a three-in-one stackable compact that packs a cream bronzer, powder blush, and highlighter all in one. So forget putting multiple makeup items in your purse. Just pop this one in and you're ready for any touch-up. It's so fun to open and close, like a little bento box, and a blush, highlighter, and bronzer are the only three items that you're gonna need this summer for the sun kiss glow. And shoppers love how creamy the texture is. I mean, the brand says they're actually infused with mango seed butter to help blend and help also to moisturize. And last, we've got a beauty product that is so useful, it's got multi-purpose in its name. This is the Dr. Papa Multi-Purpose Soothing Balm, and you can use this for almost anything. So the brand says it's actually packed with papa or papaya fruit, olive oil, and aloe vera, and it's designed to help soothe and moisturize. You can use it on your lips, you can use it on your face, you can use it on your hands and on your body. And the brand says you can actually use it on your nails and cuticles. You can use it on your hair. You can put it on your dry ends. You can even use it to help tame your brows. And get this, you can also use it to highlight your cheekbones and your brow bones. Plus, it comes in two formulas, the original and the shea butter. And again, it's such a portable size, you just throw it in your bag and go. So let's go through these products one more time. And you can use the QR code to get instant access to these items. We've got the Mango Pop t-shirt bodysuit, the button-down shirts, the jumpsuit from Pretty Garden, the faux suede mules, the Calpac insulated lunch bag, the Play Bento Trio from Kaja, and Dr. Papa's multi-purpose soothing balm. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's it for Style Finder. Up next, Summer House star and tech founder Danielle Oliveira will share her favorite multitaskers with Mako and Lofu.
Hi, welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu, and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. And don't forget the QR code on the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. Danielle Oliveira is a Summer House star and tech founder. And Summer House airs on Bravo TV, which is owned by our parent company, NBC Universal. Danielle, I am so excited that you're here today. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, we're talking about multitasking products. Now, before we do that, can we talk about Summer House a little? Oh, yes, we can. Okay, but you also work in tech as well, yes. which is amazing. How do you balance the two? I don't very well. <laughs> <laughs> I need all the help I can get. Is it difficult keeping the two separate? Yes, very. It's more of like a, a mental thing. Yeah. And if you just prioritize the right things and use a lot of fun tools to help you along the way, um, you can do it. Okay, the ultimate multitasker. <laughs> yeah. So Summer House airs every Monday. What do we have to look forward to this season? Oh my gosh. So the wedding, the big wedding between Kyle and Amanda. I think they've been through a lot this season. So it's going to be really great to see that love and that fun back on the screen. And also the reunion, yeah. of course, which might not have as much love. But <laughs> oh, a lot of spice in the reunion? A lot of spice. Oh, yeah. I'm here for that. <laughs> okay, that's exciting. Your ears pricked up. Like, yeah, okay. mm -hmm. I'm here for all the spice. <laughs> Speaking of spice, you're actually working on something really cool. You yes. have this new app, it's a fashion app. What were some of the challenges that you sort of faced in getting it up and running? Honestly, just being able to get the right resources, get the right people. Yeah funding, all of that, we still have 50% to go. Mm -hmm. So I think it's all about just getting funds. Yeah. So. Let's talk about what the app actually is. Yeah. What does it do? So it's a platform that will be a one-stop shop. Okay. So you know where you're getting inspiration for style, you're um, having shoppable moments, and you're purging your closet in many different places. Yeah. I want to bring it all in one place, nice. one platform that can help you do it all. Okay, I love the sound of that. I'm super <laughs> excited for it to come out. So let's talk about the products that you brought with this. By the way, we're all about multitasking. Why is it important to have products that multitask? I think because we're constantly on the go. Yeah. There's always something going on, and the more time you can devote to what you actually want to do and less time executing what you need to do, the better, mm. so that you could focus on what you actually need to focus on. Because we're busy girls and guys, so yeah. Okay, let's start with the first product. When do you use a tinted moisturizer? Because I'll admit I'm a little ignorant about it. When do you <laughs> use it? I actually used it this morning, okay. um, to be honest. I use it as like my base, so because it has SPF. Um, I like to start with that as like my like my foundation. Yeah. I build a little bit on top of that because I need a little bit more, you know. <laughs> Flawless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I do use it. Um, so if you've ever used a serum as your base, this is a good substitute or alternative to that. I love that. Spring and summer right around the corner. Yes. So good. Moisturize okay. and you need that SPF. Absolutely. Let's move on to the next product, another multitasker. We have this cheek and lip duo from Jouer. How does it enhance the makeup look? I think a creamy blush actually lasts a lot longer. And when you're on the go all the time, it's nice to have something that's long lasting and that you could do multiple things with. Mm -hmm. So not only is it for um, your cheeks, but you also can use it on your lips. <gasps> oh, I love yeah. how creamy it is too. Yeah. And I love that you can use it in multiple places. That's really, really nice. Okay, let's move on to the next product that we have. Let's talk about all the different ways yes. that we can use this laptop case. Okay, so I am a traveler mm -hmm. and I'm constantly working while I travel. So this is great so that you can put your laptop right in here. It stores it safe, but also you could use it as a stand. So nice. when you're traveling, you're on the go, your desk, you can just have a desk wherever you go. I like how lightweight it is yeah. too. My husband has this big chunky one. <laughs> so I like that this is so lightweight. This is so stylish. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to another type of bag, the crossbody. Yes. Now what a good moment to use a crossbody in the airport a lot or when you're going shopping. Um, when you're running errands, there's a lot going on. You have your phone, you put it right in there. Mm -hmm. And then you could use your um, the other side for your ID, for your um, credit cards, for literally anything, um, for your receipts right in there. I love this for traveling too, like just yes, a great little, right, exactly. <laughs> great little bag to take with you. Yeah. Okay, so these tank tops, Danielle, I've seen all over social media and I just absolutely love them. Why do you think they've taken off? I think you could dress them up, dress them down, and everyone loves a power shoulder. Yeah. 
like work overtime for that power shoulder. Anything with a good shoulder, I'm all about. It makes you just like look powerful, confident. It's very flattering. It's flattering, but it's great that you could layer a blazer on top yeah. of it, but you could wear it as is. I'm so into these. Speaking of different ways to wear this, these pants, these are so cute. Talk to me about how you style them. So I would wear them with a sneaker, just to dress it down every day, go to work. And then maybe if you wanna elevate that a little bit with a loafer, or if you wanna go out at night, throw a heel on. Literally, it's so versatile, it's so comfortable. The pockets, ladies love a pocket yes. moment. Um, and I just think it's another flattering piece, like that waist is just, Good for everything. It really is, and it feels so good too. Okay, you mentioned sneakers, and I feel like the 90s are coming back in a big way. <laughs> Can you tell me about these platform sneakers? I love a platform sneaker. You know why? Because why? I love some height, but I don't want to wear the heel. I know you love <laughs> heels, but I want the height without having to work so hard for it. And when I think these are perfect, it kind of elevates the look a little bit more and my mom would love for me to say this. You can yes. throw those in the washing machine and they will come out just as new. I love that. For parents <laughs> that are shopping for their teenagers, young adults, yes. I love that factoid. You can wear it in your 30s. <laughs> <laughs> they are ageless. I have them at home. Yes, multitasking ageless shoes. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This was so much fun. I loved it. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. All right, now let's run through all the products one more time. The Elta MD SPF Tinted Face Sunscreen, the Blush and Bloom Cheek and Lip Duo from Jouer, the Laptop Sleeve Case and Stand, the Cell Phone Crossbody Bag, the Shoulder Pad Tee, the Paper Bag Waist Pants, and the Sneakers from Superga. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. Up next, our editors picks with Adriana Brock, who has more star products to simplify your life. Don't go away. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Adriana Brock and we've been sharing our favorite multitaskers and it's finally my turn to tell you our editor's picks. We found the best in beauty and home 
These favorites will multitask just as much as you do. And remember, see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. Let's start in the kitchen. The less dishes we have to wash at the end of the day, the better. And this genius pan makes it so that you can whip up eggs, bacon, and vegetables all at once, and you only have to wash one pan. It is so cool. Reviewers love it for its form and function. According to the brand, it heats evenly on all types of heating surfaces, including induction and electric stove tops, thanks to the uniquely designed base. And the fact that it's a nonstick pan also makes it really easy to clean. All you have to do is wipe up grease with a paper towel and use a little bit of soap and a sponge to finish the job. Okay, I love this next one, especially for those quick weeknight dinners. If you were hoping that they made a version of the nonstick pan for the oven, you are in luck because these dividers can help you get the most out of your sheet pans and cut down the time in the kitchen. Whip up easy dinners with entrees and sides all in one pan. According to the brand, they can be reused over 5,000 times and are oven and air fryer safe up to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. And once you're done cooking, you can toss them in the dishwasher. We love a good sheet pan recipe and these dividers make them even easier. This next one is something that truly does it all. It's another space saving must have tool. It's a five in one from the makers of the viral prep deck station. You can use it for everything from herb stripping to julienne vegetables and avoid shuffling through your drawers while making dinner. It doesn't take up too much space either, so you can also cut clutter in the kitchen. And we can't forget multitaskers for the home. Investing in your linens is always worth it. These Turkish towels look and feel so luxurious. And according to the brand, they get softer with every wash. They come in a bunch of different colors to match your existing decor in the kitchen or the bathroom. And they also add a little bit of elegance to your space. You can also tie them around your waist as a beach cover up, use them to dry your hair, bring them on your next vacation as a beach towel or as a park blanket. And once you try them, you're never gonna wanna go back to terry cloth towels. These Turkish towels just dry so much faster, according to the brand. Okay, on to makeup. I am constantly running around for work, so I need my makeup to do the work for me in a pinch. And this one promises to get the job done. One Shop Today editor says this is the ultimate lazy girl product in her beauty arsenal. It's from Milk Makeup and you could use it on your cheeks and lips and you'll be ready to walk out the door. It comes in eight different shades that provide a natural finish for a fully flushed look with minimal effort. And it's not just about a pop of color though. The stick is actually made with hydrating ingredients such as mango butter, avocado oil, and apricot oil according to the brand. These are all made to hydrate your skin, and this little stick is an all-around winner in our book. Okay, so I love makeup brushes from It Cosmetics, and here's one that's a two-in-one brush. So makeup brushes tend to take up a lot of space in our makeup bags, so this two-in-one tool is a space saver, and it's so convenient. The smaller end flawlessly blends out your concealer so you can cover up dark circle blemishes in a pinch, and the larger end actually buffs out your foundation for a natural airbrush look. It can be used with liquids, powders, and cream products. And you can use it with all the products you already love. So this next one, I'm sure you guys have heard of. Yes, we are putting Vaseline back on your radar. TikTokers made us look at the drugstore find in a completely different light after we discovered they were using it as an eye cream. Though it won't get rid of dark circles, one dermatologist we spoke to told us that the formula helps keep moisture in so the delicate skin around the eyes is protected. And it's not for everyone though. So if you have sensitive skin, you may wanna hold off on using it under your eyes, but you can still use it on your elbows, lips, and other dry spots on your body. And last, a must have right now, this brand has been changing the game of sunscreen and we have their latest. There was never really a one size fits all solution for sun protection until we discovered this new launch from Supergoop. According to the brand, this face lotion is suitable for all skin types and all skin tones. It doesn't leave a white cast or a greasy finish, so you can seamlessly incorporate it into your skincare routine. Because yes, dermatologists all agree that you should wear sunscreen every day. And not only does this product provide SPF protection, but it also protects against blue light according to the brand. Let's run through the products one more time. The divided grill pan, the prep deck five-in-one multi-tool, the sheet pan set, the Turkish towel, the milk makeup lip and cheek stick, the concealer and foundation brush from It Cosmetics, 
the Vaseline, and the sunscreen from Supergoop. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's a wrap on Editor's Pick and for our show. It's been so fun showing you our favorites. Tune in next week for a special Mother's Day episode of Shop All Day. Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. Day up next on hashtag cooking, Sama Dada is saying bye bye to boring avocado toast with two of her favorite avocado packed recipes. Then she'll banish sad desk lunches forever with a savory turmeric oatmeal and crispy cauliflower popper. Hey guys, it's Sama. I am so excited to share two of my favorite recipes with you today. They both use an avocado and they're both from my new cookbook. So let's get hashtag cooking. First up, we're gonna make my avocado cream pasta and then next for dessert, because we always have to have it, my avocado brownies. And yes, I did say brownies. This avocado cream pasta is literally one of my most popular recipes on my blog and I honestly think it's because you just need a blender to make this super luxurious sauce. I'm just gonna slice these tomatoes in half. You can totally leave them whole to roast them if you'd like, but I'm just gonna slice them so that we can get that nice caramelization around the edges. Now I'm just gonna arrange them onto my baking sheet. I've lined this with parchment paper. These rogue ones wanna be left behind, but they won't be. Now I'm just gonna drizzle with a little bit of olive oil and season with some salt and pepper and red pepper flakes. Olive oil, some red pepper flakes, a little salt and then some pepper. We don't wanna roast these tomatoes for too long, only about 10 to 15 minutes. If you do roast them for too long, it will dry out those juices and we definitely don't want that. We want a juicy tomato. 
Okay, looking pretty good. Now that my tomatoes are done, I'm just gonna leave them here to hang out while I prepare my pasta. All right, very important. Please promise me you won't forget to salt your pasta water, okay? Just promise me. I'm gonna salt it, and now I'm gonna add my pasta. Straight in there. And while this pasta is cooking, I bet that I can make the sauce in the time it takes for it to be done. All you need is a blender to make this super creamy sauce. So if you've ever made a smoothie and you have a blender at home, you can make this pasta sauce. So the base of it is our avocados. I'm using an avocado and a half for this recipe. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with that. Just slicing my avocados, making sure I also don't slice my finger in there. All right, we're gonna scoop some of this avocado out. Look at how ripe and pretty that is. Go straight in there. Gonna put this. This avocado is what's gonna add that super creamy element to this pasta. Now I'm gonna move on to my lemon. Adding the juice of one full lemon in here. Make sure I catch all the seeds. This lemon is gonna really make it tart and acidic and bring out that zing. Make it very bright and fresh. I'm gonna add some fresh basil. And raw garlic. Yes, I'm using raw. It's gonna be really punchy and really bright. And I love garlic. There we go. A Little bit of olive oil. Just a bit. And now I'm gonna season it to taste with some salt, pepper, and red pepper flakes. Salt in there. Add as much chili flakes as you'd like. I love spice, so I'm going in with a lot. But you make your own choices, okay? Now, just to help everything get moving in the blender, we're gonna add a little bit of cold water. Make sure it's cold because we don't wanna brown the avocado. Just a bit, and I can add more and adjust to get it to the right consistency that I like. Now, it's time to blend. Perfect. It is so luxe, you will not even believe it. Look at that. So creamy. Did you see that? I made that pasta sauce and my pasta is done. Super quick. We love a blender recipe. Now I'm just gonna spoon my pasta out. Before I add this creamy sauce to my pasta, I'm gonna grab one more thing. Just grab some arugula from the fridge. I love adding this to this pasta because it gives this really nice peppery bite to it. All right, time to assemble. Got my sauce. Gonna add this into my pasta. You might think you put cream in this, but you didn't, I promise. I'm just gonna really stir that in. I'm gonna add my tomatoes. Just a little burst of something sweet in with this avocado cream sauce. Now I'm just gonna mix in my arugula. What's great about this pasta as well is that you can eat it immediately, but you can also refrigerate it to have as a pasta salad the next day. We love a leftover. We love a meal prep situation. This is both of these. All right, time for me to plate this for myself. Is that too much? There's never too much. <laughs> what is a portion? <laughs> I have my tomatoes that I reserved just for this moment. Place them on top. Make it look really nice, a little pop of color. And now, some freshly ground black pepper and a pinch of flaky sea salt. That is it. But one last thing, can't forget to take a photo. I didn't do all of this for nothing. I love this. I'm gonna frame this. I'm gonna put this on my wall. I think it's fair to say that it's time for me to eat. Okay, here I go. Gotta get some arugula, some pasta in there. Okay. Mmm. I love myself. <laughs> it's so creamy, you honestly would never know that there's no cream or butter in this. It's crazy.
We are so used to thinking of using avocado in savory recipes, but plot twist, they're amazing in sweet recipes too, especially when chocolate is involved. And that is where my avocado brownies come in. I've already preheated my oven to 350 degrees and now I'm gonna prepare my pan. I love parchment paper, I live for parchment paper. I've already greased my pan here with some coconut oil and now I've created a little strip of paper that I can just lay in to my pan. Stick it down because the coconut oil really helps it stick. And then I've created these nice little flaps which are gonna make it super easy to remove the brownies from the pan when they're done baking. I've got great news for you and for these brownies, everything comes together in a blender. Like you could make a smoothie, but don't. Make these brownies instead. All right. We're starting with my avocado, star of my show. Gonna slice this in half. Great way to use avocados when you're sick of the guacamole, when you're sick of all the savory things that you've been making with it. What's really nice about using an avocado in this brownie recipe is that it's super creamy and rich, so it actually serves as a really nice butter replacement and you cannot even taste it. I promise. All right, avocado is in. And time for the rest of my ingredients. I'm using two eggs here. And two. Crack that straight in there. And now I'm gonna add some creamy peanut butter. You can definitely use an almond butter if you'd like, but I love peanut butter. So we're starting with all of our wet ingredients first. Gonna sweeten this up with some maple syrup and some coconut sugar as well. And then a little bit of vanilla extract. So now I'm just gonna blend everything together here and then get to work on my dry ingredients later. I'm using an almond flour for this recipe because I think it's really nice and dense and cakey, which is gonna be really delicious with these brownies. Add my almond flour in there. Now, we're gonna use a cocoa powder. Make sure you get an unsweetened cocoa or a cacao powder. We want it to be really pure here with nothing added because we've already sweetened it with some coconut sugar and maple. Oh. Now some baking soda. Isn't it so convenient? Like, just a blender and brownies are the result? Sign me up. A little bit of salt. This is gonna be really nice to bring out that sweetness and also balance out that chocolate. And now, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna blend. You may need to scrape down the size of the blender to get it there, but just be patient with yourself and your blender. All right, we're looking really good. Now I like a little bit of a sweeter brownie, so I'm gonna fold in some chocolate chips. You don't have to do this if you don't want, but if you like joy and happiness, I would highly recommend it. I'm gonna reserve a few chips on top before baking so we can just get that nice aesthetic before it goes into the oven. You know how I operate. I'm gonna fold this in. How easy was this? Can we take a moment to address how easy this is? And now all I'm gonna do is transfer it into my pan, which I've prepared already. Look at that. You would never know there was an avocado in here. We put a whole fruit in these brownies and you can't even taste it, I promise. I smooth the batter out in the pan. Make sure it's evenly distributed. That looks pretty good. And now for my chocolate chips. Gonna add them on top. Less is not more here. That's my philosophy when it comes to chocolate. Less is just not more. In fact, more is more. All right, so now we're ready for the oven. and they are done. You can tell that the brownies are done when they start to pull away from the sides of the pan a little bit and a knife inserted in the center comes out clean. I'm so excited about this. And again, I love parchment paper. This is so easy. I'm just gonna lift them straight out of the pan like this. Pretty good form, huh? 
I'm gonna slice these, big piece for myself. I'm gonna top it with some ice cream and peanut butter because I love myself and I deserve this. It's such a clean cut too. Who needs a gym, <laughs> right? <laughs> I need a bigger scoop. <laughs> All right. And now I'm just gonna top it with a little peanut butter drizzle. I just melted this in the microwave for a little bit so it gets nice and melty and easier to drizzle. I think this looks perfect. Pretty good. Now, last step. Just gonna top it with a little bit of flaky sea salt. Partially for taste, partially for aesthetics. I just have to take a picture of this. I need to document it. It looks too good not to. Okay. That little drip right there? Is that a joke? Okay. Now I need to try this. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm gonna just leave. <laughs> It's so crazy, there's no butter or oil in these brownies, but they taste so decadent and rich. Who gave me permission to do this? Avocado, really came through today. Lunch is sort of that lost meal in between breakfast and dinner where you don't really know what quite to do with yourself. So in order to make your lunch exciting, I'm gonna hashtag end sad desk lunches and show you two of my favorites. First up, I'm gonna show you how to make some delicious spiced breaded cauliflower poppers and my favorite savory oatmeal with caramelized onions. To be honest, cauliflower is truly in everything these days. We see it in pizza, we see it in pasta, it's probably in ice cream, I don't wanna know about it. But the best way to use cauliflower is in these cauliflower poppers because you know what? They can literally do it all. They're a great snack, a great appetizer, and a yummy lunch, especially when paired with a delicious salad. The key to the cauliflower poppers, it's in the almond meal. Make sure you're buying the one with the skin still on the almonds. I find this adheres a lot better to the cauliflower, making it really nice and crispy. I want this breading to be super flavorful on its own. I don't want it to just act as a sidekick. So I'm gonna add some spices. I'm gonna add my almond meal straight into my bowl. And then I'm adding my favorite spices, 
some cayenne, some cumin, and some turmeric. Finally, we're gonna add a little pinch of salt. Now, time to just whisk everything together. The turmeric's gonna give it a really nice color as well. It's gonna be really nice and yellow and pretty. It's gonna make this cauliflower glamorous. Make sure it's really well incorporated. All right, this looks really nice. Now I'm gonna whisk up some eggs. I'm using two eggs here. We need something for the breading to stick to, so that's why we're gonna make this little egg bath situation. Perfect. Push that up. Okay, this looks pretty good. And this is my favorite part, we get to assemble. So I have half a head of cauliflower cut up into florets, and now I get to just assemble. Using my tongs, my favorite kitchen tool. Gonna stick this straight into the eggs. Roll that around nicely. You want it to be fully coated. Let any of that excess egg just drip off. We want a nice even coating, so that's why we're doing this and then it's gonna go straight into our almond meal mixture. Let the breading really coat the cauliflower well. We want it all over the cauliflower into all the little nooks and crannies. And now, just gonna transfer straight to our parchment lined pan. See how easy that was? That's crazy, that was so easy. We can all do this. And now I'm just gonna repeat with all of the other cauliflower florets. Make sure you're shaking that excess almond meal off as well. We want a nice, even coating. Pop that straight on the sheet. These are sort of like cauliflower wings. So if you're plant-based, if you're vegetarian, and even if you're not, it's kind of a fun and new way to get a veggie in your life. You can also totally use your hands for this. I'm being very neat and clean today. I don't want to crowd anyone on my pan here, so this is going to be my first batch. I am so excited for these to get into the oven. I'm gonna bake them at 350 for about 30 minutes until they're nice and golden and crispy. Well, they're ready. Just FYI, I did flip them once halfway through baking so we can get that nice and even crispness on both sides. I really like to pair this with a variety of sauces. I like to have a sauce flight, a lot of choices here. You can really use whatever you'd like, whatever sauce suits your mood. It's also really great if you wanna eat it solo. I mean, this is what I do at home, so I actually eat them straight off the pan. It's the fact. It just is this really gorgeous almond crusted exterior. Oh, it's so good. There is really nothing this cauliflower cannot do. I'll stand by that forever. Oh, I have to take a picture. I mean, come on. They're begging to be dipped and snacked on. I'm going in. Mmm, that masala on the breading, it's spicy, it's flavorful, and I'm like eating a vegetable. Like, what? You never know.
When you think of oatmeal, you're probably thinking, wow, that's such a breakfast move. But I have to disagree because oats are actually the perfect base for anything savory and grounding and delicious. I'm gonna show you how to make my really hearty, savory turmeric oatmeal with caramelized onions, avocado, an egg, and peppery arugula. It is so good. So let's get started. The first thing I want to do is caramelize my onions because that's going to take the most amount of time. So I'm just going to dice them up right now. If I cry, it's not because the onions. It's because I'm really excited to make this, just so we're clear. I'm just going to heat some olive oil in my pan and start on this caramelization. Adding some olive oil. Now that the oil is shimmering, I'm gonna go ahead and add my onions. Caramelizing the onions is gonna create this really nice full-bodied flavor. It's also gonna add a little sweetness. So oats themselves don't really have a lot of flavor. So by adding all of these different elements, we're really gonna create our own flavor profile here. We're gonna let these caramelize for about 15 to 20 minutes so it gets a really nice deep golden color and then we're gonna to get to work on our oatmeal. What's really great about caramelized onions is that you can make them in a huge batch, freeze them so you'll always have some on hand. I'm gonna let these hang out, get really delicious and caramelized and I'm gonna go grab some of my greens. Okay, it's been about 20 minutes. Can you even believe these onions? They look so good. They smell even better, if you can believe it. And now I'm just gonna upgrade them a bit with some of my favorite spices. I'm gonna add my cumin straight in here. And then my turmeric. And I really just wanna toast the spices in with the caramelized onions so they become nice and fragrant and any of that raw spice smell goes away. And finally, can't forget them, my salt and pepper. I'm gonna just roast these for a few minutes until they smell really fragrant and aromatic, and then we're gonna move on to my oats. Now it's time to cook my oats. I'm actually going to be using vegetable broth to cook them in. You can totally use water if you'd like, but I find that veggie broth makes it a lot more flavorful. I'm using rolled oats here just by the way. Give it a little stir, bring it to a boil, and let the oats absorb all of that liquid. We're boiling. Make sure you stir the oats while you cook them. This is a really aggressive boil. The liquid is reducing, the oats are thickening up. I'm gonna reduce the heat. Now, because you have so many savory and grounding flavors here, I want something a bit fresh, a little peppery bite, and that is where my arugula comes in. I'm just gonna stir in a handful here. You can choose however much you wanna add. I like a lot of arugula, so I'm gonna kinda go for it. You just want it to wilt, and then we're gonna take it off the heat. Now, it is time for my caramelized onions. You thought I forgot about them. How could I ever forget about them? I'm gonna add them straight into my oatmeal. Give that a nice stir so everyone becomes friends. Now I'm just gonna remove it from the heat and add all of my toppings. Okay, now I'm just gonna transfer my oatmeal to my bowl. Can't leave any oats behind, that'd be so rude. I mean this color though. Gotta give some props to my turmeric. Really making that magic happen. I'm adding a few things here. I like having a lot of textural elements here, so I'm gonna add some creamy avocado. It's gonna contrast those oats really nicely. I'm gonna add an egg, soft boiled egg, and maybe some more greens. We'll see how I'm feeling. I'm just gonna slice my avocado. First, I wanna just take a moment. Okay. These are kind of fat slices. I will say I didn't intend to make them this, like, chunky, but you know what? I'm just lunching at home. This is real life. The avocado doesn't have to be perfect. Now I'm gonna add my egg. Using a soft boiled egg here. I mean, I, do I need to say anything? I'm just not. I'm gonna let that speak for itself. Little salt. All right. Little pep. And finally, to finish it all off, 
some herbs. I'm using some cilantro here, but if cilantro freaks you out, you don't like it, I know it scares a lot of people, and that's okay. Like, that's totally fine. Use parsley, omit it, whatever you wanna do. I'm not gonna judge you. This looks like a pretty fat lunch. She's stunning. Um, you know who's gonna be jealous? Basically all of my friends. So I'm gonna have to send a picture to them, show them how cute my lunch is. Maybe it'll inspire them to make their own cute lunch. Okay, I think I'm ready. I'm ready to taste it. I wanna make sure I get a little bit of everything. Some of those oats, the onions, the avocado, the egg. Mmm. I wanna congratulate us all because we can now say goodbye to sad desk lunches forever. Good Thursday morning, the race to the White House kicking into gear. Yeah, with Republicans vying for attention on the national stage, it's September 28th. This is Today.